I will call the plan commission meeting of July 13th, 2020 to order. Um, and I will ask our technical facilitator to give us some insights about um, uh, doing our meeting uh, remotely. Okay, welcome to our virtual meeting. We're gonna cover a few basic items before, before beginning. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect, reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number on your original email. To members and city staff, members, if you are able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you are able, please activate your video when you are speaking. The chair, clerk, and technical facilitator are responsible for muting and unmuting committee members. Use the raise hand feature if you'd like to be recognized to speak, ask questions, or request a roll call. During any roll call, all panelists will be unmuted briefly. Uh, staff, click raise hand when you are asked a question. The chair will do their best to call on committee members in the order in which hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public who have registered to speak. The name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the board, please send it to the email listed in today's agenda. Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, the uh, first item on our agenda is public comment. Last I knew we didn't have any, but I'll look to Ms. Stouter. So we do not have any uh, general pub public comment. Uh, the next item is communications, disclosures, and recusals. Members of the body should make any required disclosures or recusals under the city's ethics code. Do we have any disclosures or recusals? Um, Commissioner Solheim. Um, I recuse myself on item 10. Thank you. Any other disclosures or recusals? Seeing none, in terms of communications, I will mention that uh, Ms. Stouter is working to try to get a special meeting um, to address our uh, goals of uh, shortening our meetings to make them a little bit more um, uh, productive and decisions being made before we're all totally worn out. Um, so if uh, she'll, she'll know in the next day or two whether she's able to um, identify a special meeting date. If not, um, it's looking like we will probably then add it to our August 10th agenda. That agenda is not looking so uh, overwhelming as some of our agendas are like tonight's in our next meeting. So that's the status um, of that particular um, item. Uh, the next item on our agenda are minutes of the June 29th meeting. Um, do I have a motion for approving? Uh, moved by Commissioner Cantrell. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Hagenow. Are there any corrections, additions, comments? Seeing no raised hands, I will assume unanimous consent unless there is a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hand to um, object, the uh, minutes pass unanimously. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the schedule of upcoming meetings. Um, our next regular meeting is July 27th. And my understanding is that's going to be a long one too. And then following that is August 10th and August 24th. Then we also have a special um, big picture working session on July 
30th, that will also be a, a virtual meeting. That starts at five o'clock rather than 5.30, five o'clock and is scheduled to last until eight. And I, I do wanna emphasize, this is a really important topic um, on housing. And Ms. Stouter sent out some materials in advance. And I would urge everyone to please um, review those um, materials carefully so that we are all prepared to do the best job possible um, at that special meeting. Okay, since it is not 545 yet, I will turn to Ms. Stouter for uh, her report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll first go over the items for the July 27th meeting. And as, as Liddell mentioned, this is a projected to be um, quite a meeting. Um, I will say that staff are working with applicant teams to figure out if there's anything that um, wouldn't be time sensitive and could shift to uh, uh, future meetings. But right now, um, I'll go through the list and mention any that we've already obtained agreement for referrals on. Uh, first on the list, there are uh, uh, plan development, both a general development plan and a specific implementation plan at Westgate Mall. And that will involve the eventual development of uh, over 400 residential units in five buildings. And also um, in a later phase, the development of a um, 250,000 square foot plus office building at the Westgate Mall site. Um, next, on the 500 block of West Washington Avenue, um, this is a rezoning also to plan development and the associated demolition of, of residential buildings to construct a new six-story mixed-use building with 103 apartments. Um, up on the north side, at, on the 1800 block of Packers Avenue, a rezoning to the neighborhood mixed-use district and a conditional use to construct a four-story mixed-use building with 71 um, multifamily residential units. Um, the item on the list that's next, the 909 to 915 Jennifer Street will be referred to a future meeting, as will the following item, the 4,000 block of Packers Avenue on the north side. This is the Ramish Farm uh, property that's, um, that's uh, uh, actually a plat for single and multifamily development in the future. That will be referred to a, uh, an August meeting. Um, next on the list there, at 2902 East Washington Avenue, this is the Ellis Deli site, demolition of that building and an adjacent building to construct a mixed use building with 135 apartments. Um, on the far west side, 8355 Mansion Hill Avenue, a rezoning plat um, and the creation of lots for future multifamily development containing a total of 300 apartments. Um, and then the last one that I'll mention on the list is at 817 Williamson Street, and that's the demolition of the one-story MTI building for the construction of a three-story building with 24 apartments. And that is at the city's Landmarks Commission as we speak this evening. That will be um, coming to you on the 27th. So again, we are working to identify any other willing parties to, to push their projects back by two or more weeks. Um, and we'll certainly keep you informed about that. Um, looking forward then on August 10th, we'll have you know a couple referrals, the Ramish property that I just mentioned. Um, the first on the list there though, this is the Dane County Jail expansion project. This one is being referred indefinitely. We don't have a date certain for this, so it will not be heard on August 10th um, as we've learned. Um, others worthy, uh, I think I've mentioned now, I'll, I'll mention 6003 Gemini Drive out on the far east side in Grandview Commons, an amendment to the plan development there to construct a new six-story mixed-use building with 153 apartments. And so like, uh, like Liddell mentioned at the beginning, we will, we will likely have time during the August 10th meeting for a conversation about our meetings and how to make them more efficient as we move forward. Um, I did want to reiterate for the in the uh, in preparing and preparing for the July 30th housing related meeting, 
Um, as, as she mentioned, I did send out some advanced reading and those are all reports that have been already uh, accepted or adopted by the city related to housing. Um, this Friday, you'll be receiving just a, a few additional materials that staff is preparing for that meeting, likely a, a PowerPoint presentation to guide our work um, during that evening. And we'll really be looking to all of you to help us prioritize and, and sift through um, many potential changes we could make through or to the to the zoning ordinance related to making housing easier to construct in the city. So really looking forward to that meeting. Um, if any of you have any questions leading up to that, um, please certainly let me know. And I think that's all I have at this time. Thank you. Um, I see that it is uh, only 540. So we will, uh, unless somebody has something that's not on the um, um, agenda, the public hearing agenda. Okay, I see that somebody does. Um, Commissioner Sundquist. Yeah, I'm sorry, I stuck my hand up but too late on the um, minutes. Um, I've heard some confusion from the Alder and a couple staff members on a call that I was on about something else about the um, Madison Yards provision that we debated and added that would uh, require them to spend $40,000 at least on TDM and that that would double if they didn't meet their goal. I think the that was being interpreted as meaning it would um, double in perpetuity, meaning go to 80, then 160, and then on up. But I believe the intent, and Mr. Hagenau is shaking his head because I he made that motion and it was consistent with a previous motion that I had made about percentage of rent, that it would just double and it, you know, that would be as high as it would go. So um, that might be some clarity to provide because I believe that's coming up tomorrow at city council. Okay, is that something staff that you could take a look at and just make sure that that's clear then? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sundquist. Thanks. And if I could, since we have another minute here, if I could also ask on that same item, I'm aware of a little bit of confusion on that related to the what items could be included within that 40,000. And it was my understanding as staff that um, that could definitely include the things that they had committed to, such as the bike share and provision of transit passes, et cetera. Um, I think there may have been some confusion on the part of the applicant that that was over and above the, th the items that they had already committed to. And so if that's something that uh, the commission agrees that, you know, that 40,000 does include all of the TDM items we discussed and that they committed to, we can make that clear in the minutes as well. Okay. That's my recollection was in Jason's nodding his head, yeah. I don't think they committed to any bus passes, but to the bike share and to um, managing the um, the unbundled parking, but what they weren't supposed to be able to charge it to was their own management person on site who was gonna, that was on, their, on them. But any measures that were like directed at the occupants, they could go against that 40,000. Alder Heck. Thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify. I, I I believe they did commit to the ten. Oh, that's right. You're passes. right. So that I forgot about that. The sort of the entry level. You know, give it a try. Ten pack. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? If not, we've got one minute then until our uh, public hearing.
Okay, it is now 545, so uh, we will begin the public hearing portion of our agenda. The um, first thing that we do is the consent agenda, including referrals. Uh, so I would note that it's the custom of the plan commission to remove from the agenda those items on which the staff believes an application has had sufficient review to warrant approval with all of the conditions placed upon it by various city departments on which the applicant accepts those conditions and there are no individuals who have registered to speak in opposition to the item. So those items are placed onto a consent agenda and we will address those at the beginning of the public hearing section of our meeting. And then people who are uh, listening in for those specifically um, would be free to leave the meeting. So of the items before us today, and I'll just read through them first, um, on the consent agenda is item three, four, and then five, six, and seven are for referral. Then again, on the consent agenda, item 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Um, are there any plan commissioners who wish to request separation of any of those items to take those off of the consent agenda? I am looking for a raised hand if there's anybody who wants to separate any items. Seeing no raised hands, those are the items that will be on the consent agenda and I will um, go through those then. Uh, the first item on the consent agenda, agenda is item three, Legistar 60904, substitute creating section 28.022 through 00443 of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of property located at 603 South Point Road, 9th Alder District from temporary agriculture to traditional residential plan district and amending the TRP zoning master plan for the Acacia Ridge subdivision. Next item on the consent agenda is item four, Legistar 60486 located at 603 South Point Road, formerly 3614 South Point Road, 9th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the proposed traditional residential plan district for a residential building complex and consideration of a conditional use in the traditional residential plan district to allow construction of a building taller than 52 feet to construct a four story 92 unit apartment building and two two family twin homes. Then the next three items are for referral. Um, agenda item five and six uh, referred to August 10th meeting at the request of the applicant and pending a recommendation by the Urban Design Commission. Agenda item five, Legistar 60907, creating 28.022 through 00442 of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of property located at 133 East Lakeside Street, 13th Alder District from Suburban Employment District to Traditional Employment District. Also being referred is agenda item six, Legistar 60480 located at 133 East Lakeside Street, 13th Alder District, consideration of a demolition permit to demolish a fraternal lodge, consideration of a conditional use in the suburban employment zoning district for multifamily dwellings, consideration of a conditional use in the suburban employment district for dwelling units in a mixed use building, and consideration of a conditional use in the suburban employment district for accessory outdoor recreation to construct a five-story mixed use building with approximately 3,150 square feet of commercial space and in 104 apartments. 
Agenda item seven, also a referral, this one to July 27th at the request of the applicant, Legistar 58786, revised 126 Langdon Street, second Alder District, consideration of final plans for a site previously approved for demolition of a residential building with no proposed use. Consideration of a conditional use in the downtown residential two district for a multifamily dwelling with more than eight dwelling units. Consideration of a conditional use to allow outdoor recreation and consideration of a conditional use to construct two additional stories in area F of the additional heights area map in Madison General Ordinances section 28.071 paren 2 paren B to allow construction of a seven story 107 unit apartment building. The next item on our consent agenda is agenda item 10. Um, Legistar 60663 located at 8150 Excelsior Drive, 9th Alder District, consideration of a demolition permit to demolish a restaurant and construct a four-story office building. Next item, agenda item 11, Legistar 60664 located at 1020 Sherman Avenue, 2nd Alder District, consideration of a conditional use for lakefront development to allow construction of an accessory building. Next, agenda item 12, Legistar 60665 located at 1127 Merrill Springs Road, 19th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in suburban residential consistent district for an accessory dwelling unit to allow construction of an accessory building containing an accessory dwelling unit. Next is agenda item 13, Legistar 60666 located at 1726 Monroe Street in the 13th Alder District. Consideration of a conditional use in a planned development district for an outdoor eating area for a restaurant tavern. Next item on the consent agenda is agenda item 14, Legistar 60667 located at 1825 through 1837 Aberg Avenue, 12th Alder District. Consideration of a demolition permit to demolish an office building and garage. Consideration of a conditional use to construct construct a mixed use building with greater than 24 dwelling units in the commercial corridor transitional district. Consideration of a conditional used to allow a multi-tenant building in the commercial corridor transitional district exceeding 40,000 square feet floor area. Consideration of a conditional use for a multi-family dwelling with greater than eight units in the commercial corridor transitional district. Consideration of a conditional use in the commercial corridor transitional district for a mixed use building with less than 75% non-residential ground floor area and consideration in the commercial corridor transitional district of a building with a street facing width greater than 40 feet that at least 75% of the ground floor frontage facing the primary street be non-residential unless approved as conditional use to construct a four story mixed use building with 1,100 square feet of commercial space and 64 apartments and a separate two story six unit townhouse building. And finally, agenda item 15, Legistar 60668 located at 1023 Emerald Street, 13th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the traditional residential consistent three district to allow construction of an accessory build building exceeding 576 square feet. We do have some registrants who um, do not wish to speak, but would be available to answer questions. Are there any questions uh, about any of the items that are on our consent agenda? Seeing no raised hands, um, I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Commissioner Cantrell. 
I'll recommend that the uh, consent agenda um, be approved and the uh, 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 items for referral be referred to the appropriate date. I'd also like to compliment the uh, Mara and Michael Crooks, the individuals that uh, submitted the uh, revised uh, accessory building on uh, Sherman uh, that we reviewed some weeks ago. Uh, their, their new proposal is much more uh, appropriate for, for the area. And I appreciate them uh, listening and, and coming back. Thank you, Commissioner Cantrell. Um, Commissioner Hagenow. Second the motion. Thank you, we have a second. Um, so I will assume unanimous um, consent um, unless I see a raised hand to object. I am looking for raised hands. Seeing none, um, the motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. Okay, now we are uh, to the full public hearing um, on the items remaining on our agenda. And the first item is a zoning text amendment. Agenda item two, Legistar 60888, creating section 28.129 of the Madison General Ordinances requiring bird safe vision glass treatment on specified buildings and structures. And I believe that we do have a presentation by staff um, by Chris Wells, um, Mr. Wells. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Planning Commission. At the February 20th working session, myself and a few colleagues and associates presented to you the threats that buildings pose to, to birds and what could be done to mitigate those threats. Tonight, we want to present to you the current proposal to add a bird-friendly glass section to the city zoning code, chapter 28 MGO. It is one that we believe is both practical and enforceable. While explaining our proposal, we will do so while comparing it to what other cities have done to help put the various aspects of the proposal into context. Next slide, please. The first thing is to determine which buildings or conditions the ordinance sh should apply to. Most cities start with location. In terms of geographic location, cities have tackled this primarily in one of two ways. Option A on the left, of which Toronto is an example, applies the ordinance to all buildings across the city. San Francisco, however, on, on the right side, um, has targeted buildings near natural, natural areas or natural features, which they believe are a particular draw for birds. Their ordinance refers to these area, areas as urban bird refuges uh, and, and defines them as open spaces two acres or larger dominated by vegetation, including vegetative landscaping, forest, meadows, grasslands, water features, open water, etc., cetera, um, as well as green rooftops of two acres or larger. That said, their ordinance sets a 300 foot buffer around these natural areas and features and requires bird mitigation for all buildings that either fall within them or fall or are a clear, um, have a clear path from those areas. The city of Madison, however, has opted for the citywide option, but is proposing a 10,000 square foot threshold in terms of building size. Staff believe that it will be easier for, for staff to apply and review as well as for the public to understand. That said, um, staff believe that there is a great amount of open space in the city with the um, abundance of parks and um, stormwater areas that a 300 foot buffer or offset would have a 
similarly, similarly large um, application across the city. Next slide, please. The next, the next aspect of bird friendly ordinances pertains to what part of the building facade area should be treated. Toronto's ordinance targets the first 40 feet from grade, while San Francisco's targets the first 60 feet. Um, for, our, for our proposal, we, are, um, we have proposed the first 60 feet as that came up the, the most um, during our research. And uh, just to back up a second, Toronto and San Francisco are kind of two of the, of the earliest, if not the earliest um, adopters of such ordinances in North America, um, and so have have had them on the books for the, for the longest. And also, in the case of Toronto, has revised their, their ordinance, I believe, three times now. I think it's every five years they they update them um, and they made them more stringent. But um, that's why Toronto and San Francisco um, were two you know two leaders, but also two that we looked at um, as uh, you know to develop this, this ordinance, this proposal. Uh, next slide. Other bird-friendly ordinances have targeted rooftop landscaping and green roofs. For example, um, Toronto targets the first uh, 13 feet of glazing above the green roof or upper story landscaping. Um, Richmond, California, which is um, across the bay from San Francisco, um, they actually kind of um, set the same parameters as on the ground and um, target the 60 feet above the green roof. Um, so it, it, it's a similar uh, application. Um, acknowledging that landscaping attracts birds regardless of, of where it is located, um, staff have proposed, in our situation, have proposed a requirement to treat the first 14 feet of glass above such rooftop landscaping. Uh, next slide. The vast majority of existing bird-friendly ordinances target fly-through conditions. As, as birds do not have the depth perception or contrast sensitivity that people do, they um, cannot see transparent or reflective glass. Therefore, see-through conditions where you can see through a portion of a building, be it a corner, that has a lot of glass on, on both sides or an elevated walkway or skywalk, et cetera. These are particularly dangerous uh, situations and especially for birds. To this end, Toronto requires um, bird safe treatment for such conditions. And we are proposing to do the same for uh, in Madison. Next slide. Finally, an additional threshold that a number of municipalities have adopted in their bird friendly ordinances is the size of an unbroken segment of, of glazing um, or like or a window or a group of windows which would require um, the treatment. And so um, looking at the, uh, at the graphic, we are proposing to basically consider um, a string of windows uh, all one, um, assuming that they are not separated by, by more than six inches. And so on the right-hand side there, even though there are effectively three separate windows, not counting the spandrel uh, up above, those would be considered one. And so the calculation would be taken across those three versus on the left-hand side, um, it's a single window. So that would end it would not be counted with the three on the right because as you can see, it's separated by six inches. And so it would be a way to um, encourage um, and, and help distinguish the, uh, the windows and uh, facilitate the calculation. Okay, next slide. This is a um, current, or is there, there's a recent proposal um, for the SSM Health and Dean Medical Group Clinic on Fish Hatchery Road that uh, nicely illustrates the, um, the last aspect of our ordinance proposal regarding the amount of um, uh, glazing uh, 
on the facade. And we are proposing a, a threshold that, that would say that if a facade is um, within the first 60 feet from grade is more than 50% um, vision glass, that we would require 85% of that total vision, you know, of the um, square footage of, of vision glass to be treated. Um, versus on the on the bottom example, which is the uh, is the north facade, that facade is less than 60, sorry, less than 50% vision glass, and therefore only the portion of windows that are larger than 50 square feet would need to be um, treated. Um, and I should say 85% of that glass would need to be treated. And so it's a way to um, to apply these uh, uh, differently, but I'll, I'll show you one other example. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So this is a um, this is the Arbor, the Arden, excuse me, on East Washington Avenue. Um, it is currently under construction. Um, and this is actually an example of a facade that is uh, less than 50% glass, 50% um, vision glass in that first 60 square feet, uh, 60 feet of grade, excuse me. Um, but because of all the banks of windows, um, those that are colored yellow um, would be would require treatment under this proposal. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Conversely, this is um, this is an example of a primarily residential building that would be largely untouched by the proposed ordinance. Uh, it's the mixed use development at 131 South Fair Oaks Avenue. It's the old Fair Oaks Nursery, um, which is also currently under construction. Um, as you can see, only the stairwells and commercial storefront glazing there on, on the bottom, the southeast elevation, have um, would require treatment. Um, I would like to to note that um, the there are several other subject experts um, either registered to speak or registered and available to answer questions as part of this presentation, um, namely um, Aaron Williams who spoke at the last, um, at the working session in February, um, and he can speak again to the work that the university is doing on campus and the cost aspects related to to, uh, to that work. So um, that is all I have for the moment. And I believe Matt Tucker um, has some thoughts that he would like to share, but I would be happy to answer questions after um, the, the public hearing. Thank you. Okay, um, as a supplement to Mr. Wells' information, um, Mr. Tucker. Yes, thank you. Uh, um, with many of these ordinances, these new concepts, uh, you know, we're, we're learning as we're drafting and we're learning as we're hearing feedback from uh, our, our stakeholders. And uh, there are three items that I wanted to share with the Planning Commission for consideration when they're, uh, when they're thinking about this ordinance uh, and uh, discussing discussing it um, uh, first is, uh, and it might might uh, just be helpful to think about, or if Heather, if you wanna pull up the slide that has the, um, the rooftop uh, green space. Um, the requirement that uh, what we looked at was, uh, we thought this was a good idea when we originally were drafting it, but in, in kind of looking across the city and the places that we have, we, we've come to find that we don't really have any of these. Uh, but we have our rooftop patios, but we have very few actual rooftop green spaces. Also, um, we don't have a definition for what would qualify as a rooftop green space. Uh, is it uh, something that has X percentage of green on up on the roof? Um, it's definitely not a green roof like you may, might see on top of the library or other types of places where they're not even really designed or intended to be harborage for birds and they're not attracting birds. So there's a question to be asked and answered really about whether or not we should have a requirement for green roofs because we don't really have them. And if we do, if the Planning Commission feels like it is a good idea uh, and they wanted to include it, they should give us that uh, direction to go ahead and make those rules as this moves on. Um, secondly, the, the slide that shows the corner locations on buildings, 
Um, one aspect that we, um, we, we don't, don't, re don't really have uh, in the words here, but I think it would be a good idea to clarify is that um, not all corners of buildings have glass on both sides of the corners. And in a situation where if you look to the left, that could be a wall without windows. Um, the regulation is intended to relate to the pass through where birds see through in the 15 foot area through the two panes of glass, if you will. And um, the idea here is uh, just to clarify in the rule that when you have a scenario where you, you have the, the, the glass at a corner, but you don't have corresponding glass around the corner on the side wall, that the requirement for that area to be entirely treated would uh, not be in place. And uh, rather that portion of the building would be treated like the 85% rule broadly across the, um, uh, uh, the facade. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, we have learned that, you know, some, uh, we've gotten some information about um, uh, some concern relative to reflectivity of um, spandrel glass. And what happens is when glass has a certain amount of reflectivity to it, uh, it might appear like uh, vegetation that might be near or in front of the glass. And so a suggestion is to consider um, establishing a requirement where that where uh, when spandrel glass is included that has a re reflectivity level that uh, is at or above, there's a, there's a known percentage, and I believe it's about 14%, um, then that glass and the spandrel glass would need to be treated just like uh, you would treat any other glass uh, on that facade, part of the 85%. Those are the only three items I had to share. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tucker. Okay, we will move on then to registrants and I will remind registrants they will have three minutes um, to speak. And I think what we will do is go through and hear from all the registrants before um, going to questions. So if you have questions of a specific registrant, please note that in your notes. Um, I'm thinking that uh, some later registrants might answer whatever questions you have and we might be able to save ourselves a little time. So we'll try that. Um, the first uh, registrant is Brian Lentz, uh, Bywater Lane, Cedarburg, Wisconsin, in support wishing to speak. He's representing the American Bird Conservancy and Mr. Lentz will be followed by Mr. Reitz, also in pro uh, support. Um, Mr. Lenz. Hi, uh, thank you commissioners for allowing me to speak today. Um, my name is Brian Lenz. I am the Glass Collision Campaign Manager for American Bird Conservancy. We are located in Washington, DC, but I live in Cedarburg, Wisconsin and enjoyed my four years in Madison during my undergraduate. Um, I work full-time on glass collisions around the world. Legislation, ordinances, code, an AIA class for architects, research, education, product design, and more. Each year, collisions with glass kill up to 1 billion birds in the United States. If you started counting now and did not stop, it would take you over 19 years to count that high. Uh, next slide, please. Madison is part of the Mississippi Flyway, an aerial superhighway used by millions of migrating birds each spring and fall. As you can see in this image, research using weather radar actually shows masses of birds flying right through this area. All of the blue areas are one night's worth of migrating birds. Land birds migrate using what is called broad front migration, meaning they are spread out over the entire landscape. So this means that collisions are a problem everywhere that there are birds and glass together. They are not limited only to certain areas. And Madison has both glass and birds, so collisions are a problem here. I am part of a team led by UW-Madison and Madison Audubon that is studying the collision issue on the UW campus. We have data that demonstrate that birds are dying at windows across the city of Madison. Collisions are also a problem every day of the year. They peak in spring and fall because that is when we have the most birds in this country due to migration. However, collisions also happen in winter and summer, especially after young birds leave the nest and also near feeders and trees and other habitat. Next slide. Bird-friendly building design is not a request for a concrete bunker. Bird-friendly buildings are beautiful, creative, energy efficient, and have lots of character. Bird-friendly design also does not significantly increase building costs. 
um, especially depending on when you decide to build your bird-friendly building. Um, if you design a building normally and then decide to change it later, it can be a little more difficult than if you have a forward-thinking ordinance like we're discussing here and do it correctly from the start. Um, Bird-friendly design can also reduce heating and cooling costs, which saves CO2 and makes a long-term cost savings for the building, not to mention that it is just the right thing to do. Next slide. Many localities across North America have adopted bird-friendly building design guidelines. The list on the right shows some of them. This is not current, so there are more. Um, and ABC has gotten the United States House of Representatives recently passed a bill to the Senate that would require this of all federal buildings. Last year, New York City passed the best legislation in the country, which covers every building in the city, from a house in Brooklyn to a skyscraper in Manhattan. So you don't need to have any anxiety over being the first to act. But Mr. Lentz, yeah. it does conclude your time. Thank you. Um, and I hope you will be around for the possibility of questions later. Um, our next registrant is Matthew Reitz, Gregory Street in support wishing to speak. Um, and he is the executive director of the Audubon Society. He will be followed by Bill Connors. Um, Mr. Reitz. Mr. Reitz. Can you hear me now? Yes. I apologize for that. Um, thank you, commissioners, for the chance to speak. My name is Matt Reitz. I'm the executive director of Madison Audubon, and I'm here representing uh, more than 3,000 members in South Central Wisconsin and the roughly uh, 200,000 self-identified bird watchers who live in the Madison metro area. Uh, and we are the leading bird conservation organiz organization in their, our community, so we know the threats that birds face. And we also know that this area is really special for birds. It's uh, within a major wildlife corridor. Any bird watcher will tell you that the whole Madison area totally explodes with migrating birds in the spring and fall. Multiple data sources will also confirm this and even uh, the radar data that uh, Mr. Lenz shared would show that as well. Uh, Madison doesn't have a next rad station which would show those, those big blobs. So the diversity of Madison's landscapes actually here, uh, the availability of lakes, the habitats, make it a really attractive migration stopover area. And as a result, Dane County has one, one of, if not the highest recorded bird species diversity of any county in all of Wisconsin. So in, in order for us to better understand the threat that buildings uh, um, pose to migrating birds in our community, um, in partnership with UW-Madison and others, we began monitoring bird window strikes in 2018. And in just two years monitoring uh, about 12 to 14 buildings on campus during migration, volunteers documented nearly 400 bird deaths. And this isn't just a campus problem because during this time we were getting reports of window collisions from the square and around the city and uh, and beyond. And they, they came into our office and they went to the Humane Society's Wildlife Center and et cetera. And if I were to estimate, I would, I mean, I have no, I have no, um, uh, this is an estimation, but it's it, there's tens of thousands of birds being killed in Madison every year. But regardless of that number, based on peer reviewed research and our own work monitoring bird strikes, we know that um, the reflective and transparent glass on building is one, buildings is one of the deadliest obstacles migratory birds encounter and doesn't need any further study. We know that already. And low rise buildings have been shown to contribute the most to bird deaths, which is most of Madison and the surrounding area. So it's a high risk area for birds. And it'll quickly address a submitted comment about the retrofitted AUG. That walkway was identified as a, pri a priority due to the number of bird strikes detected there, but dead birds were found all around the building, including on the glass corners. So in closing, I just wanna say that our, our, our city's contributing to a lot of bird loss, but it's a really preventable problem. And this ordinance attempts to strike a balance in requiring bird-friendly glass only at heights where birds are most likely to be flying, doesn't require retrofitting, well, although Madison Audubon is actually happy to work with businesses to identify and mitigate those problem spots for existing buildings. So Madison's a wonderful place. It has a wonderful natural character. This ordinance is an opportunity to continue that and uh, join other cities around the country in protecting resources. So thank you again for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Reitz. Um, our, our next registrant is Bill Connors. Um, Main Street, Madison, Wisconsin, in opposition, wishing to speak, representing Smart Growth Greater Madison. 
Mr. Connors to be followed by Kathy O'Donnell. Mr. Connors? Now we go, sorry. Okay. Uh, go? Very good. So uh, hello, I'm Bill Connors. I'm the executive director of Smart Growth Greater Madison and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. We are urging the city of Madison to hit pause on the proposed bird friendly glass ordinance and gather and analyze data before moving forward. Why? Surveying the commercial tenants, commercial tenants in the city would allow the city to assess the potential impact of the added costs imposed by this ordinance on tenants. Which businesses would be priced out of the Madison market by this ordinance? Second, the University of Wisconsin Madison is using actual data about bird deaths to make decisions about where to use bird friendly glass and we urge the city of Madison to do the same. Next slide please. We, uh, for example, uh, we, as it was just mentioned by the previous speaker and you've seen before that uh, uh, university was considering using a film with, with dots on it to add to Og Hall to address uh, bird strikes on that building. But they concluded based on actual data that the only place where they were gonna add that film was the glass walkway between the two towers. They were not going to add the film to the um, glass corner there, which has the X on it because there's not sufficient number of bird strikes to warrant that additional cost. The city could use actual bird data uh, about bird, actual data about bird deaths from existing buildings to identify high risk areas in the city. Next slide, please. We're confident that if that the city did that, we would discover that there are areas of the city that are high priority where bird glass should be mandated and other areas where it should not be mandated. As was mentioned, San Francisco does not mandate uh, bird friendly glass in the entire city. And in fact, San Jose, Oakland, Santa Cruz and Mountain View also do not mandate it in the entire city. Um, and what's more, a number of California cities only require, it don't even require it, it's a voluntary guideline. Next slide, please. Bird friendly glass adds substantial cost. The, the preferred solution is the third one listed there, which is a UV layer within the glass that birds can see, but people can't. Um, and that cost of that glass is uh, nearly four times as expensive as standard curtain wall glass. Um, and that's not the only uh, source of additional construction costs. Next slide, please. This slide shows that architect activity plummeted um, during the, uh, during, since the pandemic started. That's a leading indicator that of a slowdown in development. Next slide, please. And when slow and when development slows down in Madison, that means smaller increases in net new construction in the city's levy limit, which will make it challenging for the city to fund for um, operations and services to its residents. Next slide, please. And if we if we cannot persuade you to, to take a pause, we're asking for one change from the ordinance. And that is that rooftop landscape requirement to apply only within the first 60 feet above grade. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connors. Our next registrant is um, Kathy O'Donnell of Excess, Excelsior Drive in opposition, wishing to speak representing the Giolamis company to be followed by Arias Giolamis. Um, Ms. O'Donnell. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm the vice president of the Jalamas Company and administrator for Old Sock Trails Park Review Board. Old Sock Trails Park was developed to encourage environmentally sustainable buildings in a park-like setting. More green space is required than by the city of Madison and we were some of the first to create working water retention ponds, energy efficient HVAC systems, and we developed the first LEED Gold certified multi-tenant building in the state of Wisconsin. We also hand wrote and developed the first LEED certified cleaning and maintenance program accepted by USGBC. I'm sharing this to help you understand that we work hard to develop space that's not only good for our city and environment, but it is focused on what the businesses want. With this process, we have helped attract and retain countless businesses to the Madison area. We are at an unprecedented time in our world where many businesses are just trying to survive. We're working with tenants every day to figure out their future needs and to help them through 
this time of difficulty. We took the time to speak to over 32 businesses about their willingness to lease space with less windows and or bird safe glass that restricts vision. This slide shows it is a vision restrictor. And while adding to the cost of rent on top of this, they are not opposed to reducing bird deaths, nor are we, and we would like to work on this, but there is no interest in leasing this type of space and especially at this time. Next slide, please. At a high level, we compared our most recent development of a five-story office building in 2018 with what it would cost to construct today. With construction costs increasing an average of 7% each year since 2018, and the added costs of recent water retention rules in Madison, we are barely able to justify investment in building the new buildings now and the new increased rents. This would require in an already unstable market. To install bird glass that would not obstruct vision and daylighting would add $1.2 million to an overall project cost. You can see the percentage of that. It's not minor, it's high. And the rents would have to increase by $1.50 a rentable square foot. This doesn't include costs if we then in the future need to add more EV charging stations and any other changes that may come up. Tenants are looking for reductions in cost. Operating costs are a major concern for our tenants on top of rents. They're climbing at alarming rates and COVID is only adding to this along with other safety and other events in our nation. Our neighboring cities will not have many of these additional costs. So we forecast not only losing new businesses, but development in the future. This may challenge people that want new space. Not having a Madison address is not as critical as it used to be. And they feel that providing a safe and accessible and desirable environment for their employees and customers is more important. I'm very concerned this could also reduce opportunities to provide small minority owned and startup businesses with new space in Madison. Next slide, please. To add to this requirement without fully researching the financial implication, studying if we can do this in specific areas, Work Thank with you, our Mr. talented O'Donnell. architects. Thank you, Ms. O'Donnell. That concludes your three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registrant is Aris Giolamis in opposition, um, wishing to speak representing the Giolamis company. He will be followed by Matt Apter. Mr. Giolamis. Good evening. Good evening. My name I'm, my name is Eris Jalamas. I'm the vice president of the Jalamas Company in Madison, Wisconsin. For those who do not know who we are, we are a Madison-based development company that specializes in Class A development, management, and maintenance. Over the past 40 years, our prize development, Old Sock Trails Office Park on the far west side of Madison, has become a top-ranked office park in the state of Wisconsin and is responsible for a tax base of more than $350 million. That's property tax that goes directly into the city of Madison. Not Middleton, Sun Prairie, or Verona, but Madison. I've lived in Madison my entire life, and we are dedicated to the Madison community. We aren't opposed to reducing bird deaths, but we feel this proposal, as written, still needs research and is not in Madison's best interest at this time. Now, I could argue that we are on the front lines of, for Madison because we are not just competing with other developers, local developers, developers from out of state, but we are competing with other municipalities. Our last development at 1255 Four-Year Drive, which Kathy was just referring to, that paid $483,000 in property taxes last year alone. It doesn't matter if that money comes from downtown, east side, or west side. It all goes into the same pot. But just 20 feet away from 1255, 1255 Four-Year Drive is the city of Middleton, where no money goes into the Madison pot. We had a long battle between our site and Old Sock Trails Office Park and developers in the city of Middleton. We ended up winning that deal because we had better products. And at the end of the day, the owners wanted their company, the owners of the company wanted their employees to be in a better spot. Next slide, please. That hasn't been true for most other deals. Epic, Spectrum, Fiskers, Meet and Hunt, just to name a few, had their start in Madison and ended up moving just outside of the Madison city limits. That alone is almost that alone is millions of dollars of tax revenue each year that the city of Madison has lost. If you look at how general construction costs have risen over the years, the cost of meeting new Madison reg zoning regulations and the unknown cost of how COVID-19 will hit our marketplace, we feel that adding any uncrucial costs could kill development in the city of Madison. 
And I'm not just talking about new projects, but tenants in current buildings in Madison are going to want to relocate to new space to meet new needs. If they, if, and if they can't find it in Madison, our friends right over the border have their arms wide open for them. And I'm not just taxing about, and I'm not just talking about money and tax revenue. It's also about the mental and physical well-being of the tenants. Companies want their employees to be in an efficient, well day lit class A office space with safer, healthier environments. If we start covering up our windows, eliminating glass, and generally changing the aesthetics of a high performance class A office building, the Madison tenant space will start moving outside of the invisible line. I'm available for questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next registrant is Matt Apter, neither supporting nor opposing, wishing to speak, representing Cressa. Uh, Mr. Apter will be followed by Bradley Hutter. Thank you, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to contribute my thoughts on this very important discussion. Um, my name is Matt Apter. I'm the managing principal and co-founder of Cressa. Our Madison office is in the Machinery Row building loco located on the corner of Williamson Street and John Nolan Drive. Uh, Cresha specializes in representing commercial tenants and occupiers of commercial space. It's essentially, we become our client's in-house real estate department. A majority of our work involves helping companies negotiate leases for existing and or new facilities. Um, we work with, with nonprofits, startups, professional service firms, many companies you've heard of, including ShopBop, Zendesk, Eat Street, and Sushi Red. We know the commercial real estate market very well as we're involved in roughly 50% of the represented transactions that occur in Dane County on an annual basis. I really enjoy being able to secure spaces for my clients in beautiful buildings with amenities that offer a healthy work environment with a tenant mix that's well-rounded and diverse, including nonprofits, startup companies, and established professional service firms. The most common request I hear from our clients is to help them find spaces that are full of natural light, creative, inviting, and of course, within their budget. Budget is a very important item for our clients, one that has been difficult to navigate as construction prices have skyrocketed over the last 36 months. I'm seeing many clients decide to choose second and third choice locations simply due to cost. As such, I'm always worried when I hear of any ordinance or requirement that increases the cost to construct a building and or a tenant's interior space. Now, taking COVID into consideration, we're doing extensive work right now, helping companies determine how their existing office spaces can be used, if at all. We expect significant changes into how offices are designed, moving away from cubicles, trending more to more of an, an, uh, an enclosed office intensive layout. Many companies are concerned about keeping their locations in densely populated areas and have expressed interest in moving to suburban office parks in, Mitch, in Middleton, Fitchburg, Verona, and Wanakee. Another hot topic is adding air filtration solutions to HVAC systems. All of these items will cost companies and building owners significant dollars. The COVID discussion changes daily, so I'm sure we'll see many more requests that building owners will need to address and possibly implement into their existing and future buildings. All in all, I'm concerned that any increase in costs for existing and new buildings will result in rents to increase significantly and take them out of reach for most nonprofit and startup companies, including, including many other local based companies. In closing, my suggestion is to table the bird glass ordinance discussion until we have a better understanding of the impact of COVID and, and how we'll have or how will the impact of COVID on commercial buildings and how tenants will utilize office spaces. I welcome all questions. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. After. Um, our next registrant is Bradley Hutter, uh, West Beltline Highway, uh, opposed wishing to speak, representing MIG Commercial Real Estate to be followed by Peter Cannon. Mr. Hutter. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I'm also the president of Smart Growth Greater Madison where we represent uh, um, over 100 different uh, members uh, in the development community. And um, I'm per personally, I am a, I'm a bird lover as well. You can call me in that 2000 self-identified bird watchers. I've got nine feeders in my backyard. Um, and we, I think that the idea of this is something that has a lot of merit, but at the same time, I'm also asking that the, that the committee a pause on this and collect more data specifically is 
as Bill talked earlier about high priority locations in the city of Madison and, and how we could be more specific in the implementation of this ordinance. If we were going forward with the project right now, as Matt Tucker pointed out, we wouldn't even necessarily know how to design to it since, for example, there's, uh, if we're doing, as we, as Matt knows, we've often done patios and green areas and so forth. We wouldn't know what the definition of a green roof would be as we went forward with the new water uh, stormwater ordinance related to the bird glass. Uh, Eris Gilamas was kind enough to uh, put up a number of photos, some of which were, uh, one of them was Arbor Gate development on the Central Beltline. That project in uh, South Madison um, brought daycare uh, that was never there previously, um, restaurants like Bonfire, uh, financial access, uh, workout facilities, as well as uh, over 500 uh, jobs to South Madison. We uh, effectively wiped out the uh, the crime er the crime that had been going on in the Todd Drive area for a long time. And uh, that project itself would uh, very likely, if not surely, would not have been able to proceed um, under the current bird glass ordinance, even though it's directly across from the uh, Arboretum. Uh, we've worked with the Arboretum and, uh, and uh, cut down the amount of stormwater that's used to sheet flow back in, because of the designs in the 60s and 70s into the Arboretum in that area. And, that, and uh, so, so we are incredibly supportive of environmental concerns and incredibly supportive of the idea of reducing bird deaths. But the costs, as we look at the actual numbers for the city of Madison, not comparing it to uh, Toronto with a population of approximately, what, 6 million? Um, but Madison itself, looking at that, well, how, how can we specifically be smart and uh, put forward an ordinance that, uh, that uses data about the high-risk areas of the city and high-priority areas of the city in order to um, mitigate the bird deaths without creating the cost increases that Kathy showed that could and probably would um, force uh, tenants to go to other municipalities, maybe even other states, and certainly is going to put a crimp on uh, women, minority-owned startups, and other you know aspects of diversity that we absolutely support. We want to get those types of of growing businesses into our facilities, but they simply wouldn't thank be. Able to thank make, you, to thank you, make, Mr. Hutter. That does conclude your time. Um, the next registrant is Peter Cannon, Cherokee Circle in support, wishing to speak, um, to be followed by Christina Ciano. Mr. Cannon. I not see anyone by that name. Okay, we don't see anybody. Uh, our tech facilitator doesn't see anybody with the name Peter Cannon. So um, if uh, Mr. Cannon wants to try to get his name in, we'll, we'll uh, come to you later then. Um, the next um, registrant is Christina Ciano of East Main Street in Sun Prairie in support and wishing to speak to be followed by Robert Proctor, Ms. Ciano. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Um, the last name is Chiano. My name is Christina Chiano. Thank you for correcting me. Um, thank you. And I also want to thank everyone um, present uh, for allowing me the opportunity to speak um, about this important issue. I um, am very troubled to hear the last half, last number of um, corporate people talking about um, about the cost of um, mitigating bird window collision strikes, and it bothers me that this the subject the subject of like protecting wildlife and the environment always turns into an issue where it becomes it's the economy stupid, or it's COVID, and we have to wait because of COVID. And I think that's an absolutely ridiculous idea. We have a president who can't even admit that we're in the throes of a dangerous pandemic and we're supposed to wait for COVID-19 to pass and have all these uh, studies based on like the economic outcomes. We're in a difficult time and that's a given. And this is an opportunity to embrace and admit that we're like wreaking so much havoc on the world. 
And I want to read something. And maybe all of you or most of you are familiar with um, this article. But last year, there was a study published in the journal Science. And it reported shocking environmental statistics revealing that since 1970, 50 years ago, bird populations in the United States and Canada have declined by one third. That's, that's huge. Three billion birds have disappeared from North America. Okay, um, that's an abysmal reflection uh, on us as human beings and the destruction that we have wrought on wildlife and avian wildlife in particular. And we're doing that by destroying habitat through uh, developments, I will add, and um, through uh, cats, and um, importantly, through uh, these bird window collision issues. Um, this is not a trivial issue. This is not a novelty. This is a huge um, killer of birds across the world. And this study says, Birds are indications of our environmental health and that as this decline clearly shows, the natural world is so severely impacted by human activity that it can no longer support the same robust wildlife populations as it once did. There is a Bird Safe, Safe Building Act, but it's probably languishing in the Senate because of all of the Republicans who are sitting on any substantial legislation for just about anything that affects the quality of people and wildlife. Um, but I would also like to add one more thing. I happen, I am citizen, I am a birder in case you haven't noticed that. And I have volunteered with the Madison Audubon Society and this study is very meaningful that they're doing in conjunction with the university. Ms. And Chico, I- Ms. Chicano, um, that does conclude your time. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you'll be available for questions. Uh, the next uh, registrant is uh, Robert Proctor, East Main Street, Madison, in opposition, uh, wishing to speak, representing Realtors Association of South Central Wisconsin. Mr. Proctor. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Robert Proctor. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Realtors Association of South Central Wisconsin. We represent over 3,000 members in the housing market for the area. And our main concern in, in just to uh, follow up on what was presented by Smart Growth Greater Madison and a number of the developers are the additional costs to construction. Construction costs have been skyrocketing and these costs get passed down to the people that have to live in the buildings. And so from our point of view, we look at the renters. 50% of renters in Dane County are cost burdened. That means that more than that they spend more than 30% of their income on their housing costs. And this is an incredibly important issue, the affordability issue. And so although we truly believe that this um, ordinance is well-intentioned, that the issue regarding birds striking windows is an important issue. We agree with Smart Growth Greater Madison and some of the other speakers that we need a pause to make sure that we get the costs of this under control, the best way to do it, and to make sure that it's just not another burden that's gonna get passed down to renters in Dane County and renters in Madison. Appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Proctor. Okay, that concludes the registrants who wish to speak. I will read in then to the record those who have registered. Yes? Uh, I believe I did find a uh, Peter Cannon. Oh, good. Uh, okay. Is, I'm gonna, let's get this a shot here. Ah, uh, there. I see. Okay. Mr. Cannon, you're on. Okay. Um, it always, I can never know whether to be amused or annoyed. Um, everybody is in favor of uh, not killing birds, but there's always a but. But this, but that, but the other. Uh, let's, let's put it off, you know, probably till there are no birds left, and then we won't have to spend money on bird friendly glass. Um, how many bugs do a, million, a billion birds eat? What's the value of bird watching to Wisconsin's economy? What's it worth to see a hummingbird? Externalities. Why should developers consider externalities like these? 
dealing with glare from glass, runoff from construction site, parking issues, they cost money and they make nothing for the developer. So we require developers to deal with externalities. Each year in the US between 365 and 988 million birds are killed as they collide with windows in urban buildings. That's according to the best estimates available. This is not sustainable. It is usually easier to keep something from breaking than it is to fix it after it breaks. It's much easier to act now to keep common birds common than to wait until the species is in serious decline. How long can we continue to kill hundreds of millions of birds every year before many species become uncommon? What will it cost to deal with unintended externalities? For example, diminished bird populations consume fewer insects, which can lead to crop damage, additional pesticide use, increased human health problems caused by the pesticides. Over half of bird deaths and collisions with glass are attributed to buildings less than 12 stories tall. Bird-friendly glass is a simple way to reduce the toll. It's something we can do now instead of waiting until the problem is severe. Let's use bird-friendly glass and keep common birds common. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Okay, I think that concludes our uh, speakers. I'm going to read into the record those who registered um, but not wishing to speak, but also available to answer questions. So Aaron Williams, Mills Street in support, not wishing to speak, available to answer questions, representing UW-Madison. Anne Boucher, uh, Squire Circle Middleton in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Crystal Sudheimer, uh, Fish Hatchery Road in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Joan Bell Call, Esh Lane Madison in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. In addition, we have 53 other registrants who support the ordinance, but did not indicate that they would be available to answer questions. Okay, now moving to questions of our speakers. Could you please uh, raise your hands if you have any questions for any of our speakers? Alder Furman. Thank you, Chair. I had a question for um, the first speaker, um, I believe was uh, who did the presentation on and showed a, a bunch of cool graphics on different ways uh, buildings can handle um, bird glass. Um, I, I think that I was Mr. Mr. Lenz from the American Bird Conservancy. Does that sound right? That was That sounds right. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, Mr. Lenz. Hi. Hi, Mr. Lenz. Um, I appreciate your presentation. Um, we heard uh, uh, from a bunch of other speakers um, this evening concerns about um, visibility and sunlight and people's desire to um, be in buildings where they can see out the window and have sunlight. And I wanted uh, to give you an opportunity to, to possibly talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I assume you're you're somewhat familiar with our ordinance. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll I'll push on staff as well, or ask staff a little bit to talk about that as well. But um, if you could address some of those concerns, I'd appreciate it. Uh, sure, I would be happy to. And you know, thank you for posing the question. Um, if you are using a, a UV solution, it doesn't impact the visibility at all. Um, Something as simple as an external insect screen is enough, and we're all used to those. Um, the patterns themselves, if you are talking about a pattern that is etched or frit or printed or however you're gonna put the pattern on, can cover as little as 7% of the glass and be effective. So those patterns don't impact visibility. They're not all like the patterns that the Bucks used on that one section of windows. I worked on Pfizer Forum with the Bucks, um, so I know that one inside and out. Um, we have places that do retrofits, which is taking an existing building and putting up a window film, which actually costs a lot, which is part of the math that went into what was going to get addressed at AUG and what wasn't. Um, 
And we've had places that have put those dot patterns up and had people in offices whose windows were treated not know that they were treated. They have two windows in their office and it took three days and someone else pointing it out. So it's not really a visibility concern. The only time that comes up is in this kind of a conversation before it happens. Um, so there are all kinds of different ways that you can, can do this and people um, universally like it when it's done and are happy that they are in a building um, that is bird friendly. And there was a lot of discussion too about um, it being good for um, people's health and people wanting to be in the buildings they're in. Nobody wants to be in a building that is killing birds all day long and listening to bird death. And we hear those complaints a lot because those places come to us and say, our tenants, our clients, the um, people that come into the retail spaces are dismayed by this and we need to fix it. And then when you're doing it after the fact, it costs a lot more than doing it before. Great, thank you. Does that conclude your questions for now, Alder? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Alder Rommel. Hi, thank you. Uh, this question is for Mr. Lynch. And, you know, maybe we could have um, staff put up those interesting designs, as uh, Alder mentioned, because that's the thing I um, come back to is eventually we might need to start thinking about how we design buildings. And I'm wondering what you have learned about that. And then to speak to um, Mr. Apter's points about COVID and how that might be affecting um, how people use buildings. And I'm wondering if you've run into that in your work. Uh, with, with COVID, the only thing we have really run into is it's slowing down the kind of conversations about things, not because people wanna back burner it, um, just because everybody has been adjusting to remote work and things like that. Um, so people are gonna keep building buildings um, that's going to keep happening no matter what. And if you add a marginal half a percent cost to change the glass so it doesn't kill a, a pile of birds every year, um, you know, that building is still going to get built. It's not going to be not built because it should be bird friendly. Um, as far as the interesting building designs, we are also starting to see a trend towards people stopping building all glass. Um, that was popular for a while, but now that there are a lot of all glass buildings, um, it's starting to become less popular. Um, there's also new research showing that psychologically experiencing buildings like the ones that you see on the screen um, actually has benefits for people as opposed to walking by, you know, a building that is primarily glass and, and boring and has really nothing going on with it. Um, the other thing to kind of highlight is uh, Nine, over 99% of the collisions happen at buildings that are under 11 stories. Um, so 46% happen at buildings that are zero to three stories and 54% um, happen at buildings that are four to 11 floors. So Madison is really kind of in, in the wheelhouse here for the buildings we're looking at. Um, and birds fly all over and aren't near parks. So you can't really just really effectively do this by restricting it to parks. So it's really kind of an every building approach. Great, thank you. And can I add one quickly too? Um, we, I would be happy to give the American Association of Architects, or American Institute of Architects continuing education class for anybody who would like to kind of get a longer walkthrough of this issue, kind of go top to bottom with us. Mm -hmm. um, so let me know, I'm available whenever you would like. Thank you, Ms. I, I actually think that's a really good idea because I think we need to just train ourselves to think differently about what the opportunities are. And I would, I don't know how to ask you to do that, but I, I, <clears throat> I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Rummel. Did you have further questions? <clears throat> I have one for Mr. W Mr. Williams. Okay. For First, could I ask while Mr. Lenz is um, back up, did anybody have questions for Mr. Lenz? Um, Commissioner Cantrell? I, I think this is appropriate for Mr. Lenz. I guess there was questions raised about the cost of, of this uh, type of glass. And I guess uh, if, if he can respond to the cost uh, of 
of, of this uh, type of glass in a, in a new office building or residential building? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. Cost comes up and is tricky. Um, often the people who are opposed to such an ordinance will take um, usually lower end glass than anybody would consider using as the baseline and then go to Ornolux, which is the most expensive option for this and say, look at how much more it costs. Um, and Frit and etch and ceramic patterns and certainly window screens and all these kinds of things are used in every building anyway. Many of them, you just have to change the patterns. Um, if you go to an architect who's never heard about fritted glass or has never heard about bird friendly design, excuse me, and say, well, fritted glass is one way you can do it. They say, oh, really? I know what that is. I use it all the time. They just have to change the pattern on it. Um, so for many buildings, it doesn't really add much because a lot of these materials were going to be put in anyway. The way you can make it look like a big difference in addition to kind of cherry picking the upper and lower kind of set of glass options is by designing your full building, ignoring all of this. And then afterwards, when you're done, trying to shoehorn your existing building into being bird friendly. Um, because then people say, well, I've got this aesthetic and I want it to be perfectly clear. And so UV is the only option. And again, that ends up making it as expensive as it could possibly be. Um, so there is a way to blend this, you know, for a storefront window, you could have UV on the storefronts and frit and screens and other options um, elsewhere. Secondary facades, solar shades, you can see the New York Times building there. I wouldn't care what glass you put behind that screen they've got. You could put a perfect mirror back there and nothing is going to hit it. And that also is shading the building. So if you would like to continue like a, a larger discussion of costs, these options also reduce heating and cooling costs, which the developer, quite frankly, it doesn't matter to them because they get out of the building usually. They build it and then other people are in it. Uh, but for the people who are paying those bills going forward, um, you're lowering their costs at the same time as making it bird friendly. Thank you, have, Mr. Lenz. Uh, Commissioner Cantrell, did you have further questions of Mr. Lenz? Yes, one other question. I, um, staff is proposing that uh, the ordinance apply to uh, 60 feet above grade. And uh, Toronto is one example that uh, they showed was only 40 feet, but San Francisco uh, um, uh, a more limited area was, was up to 60. Um, in, in your experience in other cities, that you've worked with or uh, reviewed their ordinances, what's the most common? And, and obviously I assume it depends on the area of the, the United States you're in, but, but I guess I'd like your opinion on that. Um, we, I mean, the, the different heights and the different ordinances are just kind of the result of this being, you know, a disorganized process across the continent. Um, San Francisco went first and the reason that so many places have legislation that looks like San Francisco's, especially in California, is because they are copying what's close and what went first. Sure. Um, we actually don't recommend the San Francisco legislation if that's what you're going to do um, today. Um, it is certainly better than nothing, but you can get um, quite a bit more done. As far as the above grade, really the we need some better technology to study exactly how high up collisions happen. And I'm, that's one of the research projects we're working on. Um, but studies have shown that where there's a reflection of vegetation, you have the most collisions. So kind of a proxy for how high up you would need to go would be the height of the mature tree canopy plus maybe 50 or 100%. Um, in collision speak, we kind of call this the daytime activity zone. So if you're looking at birds flying around, they're moving between trees and vegetation or slightly above them. You don't see a cardinal flying at 400 feet generally during the daytime. Um, so those heights have come from kind of mature tree canopy plus a percentage if you could, if you could get the percentage in as where most collisions happen. Okay, okay well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does that conclude your questions of Mr. Lenz? Yes. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, 
Uh, I've just become aware that we did have another registrant who registered um, in time, but the, the system had been glitching during that time. So we do have an additional registrant if, if the commission's willing to reopen the, the hearing. Okay. Um, we have not yet closed the public hearing. We're in question, so we can go ahead and hear from him. What I'd like to do is continue with the questions of uh, Mr. Lenz while he's up and then go to uh, the other registrant. So um, Alder Heck. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this, is, this is for Mr. Lenz and it may drift into a discussion with Mr. Tucker later, but I'll stick with Mr. Lenz for now. Um, Mr. Lenz, you, you mentioned something in your, in your uh, presentation or an answer to a question about 7% of glass uh, needing uh, some sort of treatment etching. I'm not sure exactly what you were referring to, patterned glass. Um, can, can you repeat that and, and explain what you were referring to? I think that uh, my, my, my question is really, are you, are you, you know, we're talking about 85% of a wall needing treatment, but are you saying that actually only 7% of that 80% may need treatment in order to be effective and that that's probably how our, our proposed ordinance is designed? So that is a great question and I can see why my answer <laughs> was confusing there. Um, what I was referring to is the actual amount of the glass that the pattern itself is going to cover. Um, so if you have a pattern that is quarter inch dots that are two inches apart. It covers only a fraction of an individual piece of glass. Um, so at the lower end, the patterns that cover the glass themselves can take up as little as 7% of the total glass surface. Um, so you would still be looking at covering 85 or 90% of the building in the correct zones in patterned glass but the pattern on the glass itself is, is a lot more subtle than people think, which is why I started off with the slide about not, not aiming for a concrete bunker that you're getting buildings you can still see out of. Okay, so your, your point was kind of about the aesthetic experience maybe of people inside the office building not really being impacted. An additional point about that, it wasn't about a reduction in cost or something like that. Correct. Thank you. Was that it, Alder? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Hagenow. Yes, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, Mr. Lenz, uh, just wondering if you can talk to, you know, the, the, the ordinance that staff has put together, um, talks about this applying to only structures greater than 10,000 square feet in size and uh, windows that are 50 square feet or larger. And, and I'm kind of wondering if you can talk to that a little bit. Um, you know, I, I guess, and my, my reasoning here is I, I had stayed at a, at a cottage once out on a lake and, you know, it was a fairly small cottage. Um, and every morning we woke up and we found a dead bird out on the patio and it was a very distressing kind of stay for a week. Um, and so it struck me that just because a building is 10,000 square feet or larger doesn't mean that the 5,000 square foot building isn't going to necessarily kill birds as well. So is that is that something that you can speak to? Um, yes, yes it is. I actually have evidence of a bird striking a one square foot window. So, um, you know, pretty much any any glass in the environment is going to be a problem, um, or potential problem, I should say. I worry a lot less about a one square foot window than I do, you know, a fifty square foot window. Um, so one of the the big problems that birds have is generally re reflection, and then second, thinking they can fly in one side and out the other because they see habitat on the other side. Um, and for a reflection, if you consider a fifty square foot window and a bird that's six inches across there is no obstruction there for the bird. So if it's sitting in a tree and that window is there, if it's a 40 square foot window, it's gonna fly right into the window. Um, this is why home windows can be so bad. Um, when we talk to homeowners who say they have a collision problem, we say 
pay attention to your whole house. When you hear a collision, fix the window and then keep going until you don't hear anymore. And pretty soon you'll have done a handful of windows and you'll be done. And normally the ones that don't end up needing to be done have screens and are small and have mullions and muntins. Um, and the slightly bigger ones tend to cause the most problem. And if you think about what is a decent sized home window, you know, the windows I've treated on my house are probably 10 square feet. And those were the problem windows. So for the window size and the building size, our goal is as small as possible. Because um, again, remember, 46% uh, of the collisions happen at buildings that are zero to three floors. Um, and that's where you start getting you know, significantly below 10,000 10, square feet. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions I have. And I'm sorry to hear about your vacation experience. But that's, that, that's, exactly, that's exactly what we're talking about in terms of this also being good for people who occupy the buildings when they're done because that wrecked your whole week. Yep. Thank, would, you thank go you. Back, would you go back there? Thank you, Ms. Mr. Lance. Um, I appreciate your, um, your speaking to these issues. Um, I don't see any more raised hands right now. Um, you know, we might still have more questions of Mr. Lenz in the future, but this is, uh, so we'll move on to the uh, uh, late uh, registrant, late through no fault of his, Joshua Napravnik. Uh, Crandall Avenue um, in support and wishing to speak. And I'm sure I pronounced your name wrong, but anyway, you're on. Mr. Napravnik. You're unmuted from our side. So can you press your, yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay, you're on. Had some audio issues. Um, yeah, so this is for the Monroe Street Garth's Brew Bar, correct? No. Oh, that was what I registered to speak. Oh, okay. This is agenda item two. Um, yeah, I did not register to speak to this item. Okay, then uh, we'll take you off and uh, hear from you um, later. Actually, I, I think that item has already been approved on the consent. Uh, on the, the one he wanted to speak, okay, has already been approved on the consent agenda and he was in support, so um, that's fine. Okay, um, Alder Rummel. Hey, thanks. Um, back to Mr. Williams, if I might, to ask about you know, we heard some from some of the, the speakers concerns about studies and maybe just a little more detail about how the university is working on this, who their partners are, where are they doing anything beyond the university? Just help us understand what's going on in your world. Okay, Mr. Aaron Williams. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, for the question here. So yeah, so Aaron Williams, UW Madison Facilities Planning and Management. So um, we are the department division that is kind of responsible for all the development uh, and maintenance of buildings on campus. The bird collision um, core came about due to the, uh, a, the surf project, which is now uh, recently uh, called the NIC uh, on West Dayton Street. Um, due to a, a neighborhood uh, question um, during the planning process back, I believe in 2016, about what we're doing for bird friendly glass. So as part of that engagement process, our neighbors um, who are often correct in bringing things forward that we're not necessarily aware of all the time, um, really got this thing kickstarted. Um, and through that process, although the NIC itself didn't change too much um, from what was originally proposed from a glass standpoint, um, many of the projects after that have. So what we did is we, we uh, created a symposium back in 2017, brought uh, some of the leaders around the industry, uh, any at architects out of New York, uh, Stanley Temple, who emeritus professor, uh, conservationist on campus, um, Anna Pigeon um, in the Department of Wildlife Ecology at UW. And we talked about um, the impacts and also Matt Reitz who spoke previously. We talked about the impacts um, the ecology side, the economic side, design inside, design side um, of 
of this issue, and if it was an issue uh, at all. So from that symposium, I think there's about 50 to 75 people that attended. Um, the Bird Collision Corps was created, and we kicked off in the spring of 2018 our first monitoring section or period. Um, so we've done four monitoring periods. They've been halted uh, due to COVID um, and the fact that campus has closed. We, we can't have people on campus uh, walking around buildings. So we have we have data from four um, uh, migration periods. Uh, we monitor between 10 and 15 buildings on uh, about 30 volunteers or so. Uh, monitor those on a regular basis throughout the migration period. Uh, you can see those dates up on the screen right now. Um, we have very specific protocols, what they're looking for. Uh, and then most importantly, everything is entered um, through iNaturalist, which is a GPS uh, located um, app that they can use on their phone. So we do have the geolocation of every bird strike. Um, and so that gets at the AG Hall mitigation project that was mentioned previously. Um, so we took that data and we're, that, that core is still very much an active group and wishing to get back out on campus as soon as we open here September 2nd um, to our students. Um, and started to understand, well, where are our biggest threats and kind of where's the low hanging fruit and where can we be opportunistic about um, um, reducing this threat? So uh, I, we, we have completely different stakeholders uh, than the private side, I, I get that. We have completely different architectural styles, um, but nonetheless, it's, a, it's very important sort of to our resiliency commitment as a university, uh, to the, the teaching, research, education component of who we are and also this ability that it's it's not human centric what we're trying to do but it's really environmental centric environmentally centric um so that is where this is kind of leading us and not not, not really looking at this from the cost um perspective i mean that is an important de determinant uh, it's one of many things um, that was mentioned previously the externalities that we have to address in our projects and what gets in and what does not get in but just flipping that and understanding what's the bird value that's out there. And we do believe that there's an intrinsic value along with a, a pollination, a water purification, uh, ecosystem services value that birds do have. Um, I'm not a birder, um, but I, I do find the value of this and the, the, the thing that keeps bringing me back to the, that thud sound that everyone has heard in their life against the building is, is pretty detrimental. I mean, it's something that you only have to hear once, you know exactly what it is. So um, we, we can do better. And that's really our approach to um, our guidelines going forward and what we've kind of adopted as guidelines. Um, they are not required on every building. Um, they're uh, guidelines that are taken in consideration with everything else. So that's kind of, but it's been, it's been very factually based on what we've um, taken from the monitoring um, and then trying to apply that with what other people are doing around the country um, to our own buildings. So I'll stop there. I think that explains what, where we've come from and kind of where we're going. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Alder Rummel, did you have any further questions? Yeah, thank you, I do. Um, so it sounds like it's not a, a, an, a thing that happens the same across a space, like some, like the uh, hall example, it sounded like from <clears throat> the presentation earlier that part of it was more um, prone to bird strikes than others. Is there some rationale that you could help us know why that happens or what we could learn from that? Well, it gets back to what everyone I think has spoken to uh, previously. I mean, reflectivity, transparency, pass through are kind of the things that we're looking for on buildings. Uh, you can see from the image here, there's direct pass through here. Um, and it's it's also in what we would call a box canyon where it's actually, it's actively drawing in birds. It's a landscaped area that they're gonna wanna go to naturally. Um, so I, I do actually would like to say this dot mitigation has now been put up. It was put up last week. So if anyone wants to go out and see what the dots look like in person, feel free, you can walk up to the building. Um, but the, uh, and yet why it was not put on that put on the 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 glass corner i guess of the other side is we didn't see as many gps locations of birds in that area um but also um fund, funding is a it's a concern it is an obvious concern um and we got some grant money to do this uh, as well as housing contributed a significant amount so we had we stretched that as far as we could and this was kind of the primary de determinant area so as what brian lens was saying is you know you can see a strike on a 12 inch, you know, square piece of glass. We have to go after sort of where that biggest impact is. And we felt that 
um, this was that location. Okay, thank you. So you only have done the campus. You haven't really partnered and done any other locations. No, no, I'm concerned only with campus. Um, that, I mean, Og Hall was the first sort of mitigation. Um, we have a project in construction right now that has mitigation on all of its windows. And then both the vet med project and gym natatorium project, which will be delivered here within the next four to five years, will also have mitigation on it. So it is becoming, uh, it's on all of our future projects, it is going forward. Thank you very much. Alder Heck. Thank you. Just a, a quick question for Mr. Williams. Um, you, you discussed the corner section of Og Hall. Are there other corner uh, <clears throat> buildings with glass corners on campus that you've investigated and or, and or do you have any feelings about uh, about the glass corners being an effective uh, way to reduce bird collisions? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I, I think we can start looking at Music Hall, Hamill Music, which was just put up. That's got a couple of glass corners. Um, it's it's what Brian also spoke to. It's This is the architecture du jour right now. Um, we can manufacture glass like we've never been able to before in both size, scale, and scope and ship it wherever we want. So it, it's a, an inexpensive, I would say, material um, as to opposed to maybe a, a terracotta or some sort of facade material. Um, so it's what architects are using. We do have the benefit of having a design review board that sees all of our buildings. Um, and this needs to be, I guess, couched in the the context that we have multiple delivery methods of a project. Um, most common, those are being delivered through the state process. Um, so they do have, um, and they are modifying their sustainability requirements to include a bird glass component as well as we speak right now. So, um, but getting back to the design review board, there are very specific things that they can recommend or look at. Um, and right now, bird glass is something that they're looking at um, in those discussions um, are happening with the architects during the early stages of the design process. So I don't think you're going to see um, a lot of buildings going forward that are going to have sort of, you know, these, these see-through corners and whatnot on them um, or else, you know, or else mitigation would be recommended for those areas. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions for any of our registrants. I'm looking for raised hands. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Are there questions of staff? Commissioner Hagenow. Yeah, I guess, <clears throat> I, uh, I guess back to my kind of original question that I posed to Mr. Lenz, um, why, why was the 50 square foot window size kind of settled on? And, and then also is the 10,000 square foot building size? I can, I can address that one and then Matt, Chris, feel free to jump in. I think we were, you know, we're looking at a variety of other cities in closest touch with Toronto and San Francisco on this and trying to think of, of a way to get this started out on the right foot. I think when we think of uh, 10,000 square foot buildings, um, you know, you're, just for context here, I guess your, your average convenience store, Walgreens is maybe 25, 30,000 square feet. Um, your, your average home is probably, you know, 2,000 square feet-ish. Um, so that's that's just a little bit of context there. I think we wanted to um, start with something that would impact, um, you know, most commercial buildings across the city. And by impact, I mean that it would, it would cause them to pause and think about design considerations when they're moving forward with, with their building design early on. Um, and the 50 square foot window, I think that that's something that 
you know, if you if you think about our typical uh, multifamily residential building that we uh, at the, in the plan commission realm, we see quite a few examples of. Um, we think that many of those windows on upper levels are are smaller than that, um, and that this would really primarily apply to um, commercial structures. Um, now, certainly, certainly some residential structures as well. You know, there are examples of residential development with quite a lot of uh, glass coverage um, on the building as well. But I think we wanted to. Um, I can't say strike a balance. We wanted to uh, find a balance um, that that really tried to address concerns of the development community while making a meaningful impact ecologically. And we felt that this was a, a great starting point, um, a practical place to begin. I will say that when we talked with folks in Toronto um, and other cities as well, I think Toronto was on their third version of this ordinance after beginning it back in 2005. Um, this is something that certainly could be amended over time once we have more, you know, more data. Assuming it's it's adopted in the coming coming weeks, coming months, um, it's something that we'd like to track and make sure that we're um, we're open to changes at a later date. But I think that uh, we wanted to start with easy to understand thresholds that were, were really clear for uh, developers and staff. Thank you. Does that conclude your questions, Commissioner? Okay, thank you. Um, Alder Rummel. Thank you. I have a couple sort of related questions. Can someone talk about how many office buildings get built that are kind of our stereotypical glass buildings on average in a year in Madison? I'd look at, um, looks like Matt Matt has his hand up for that. I, I don't know an average number of office buildings. Right. But Matt. I think we're probably Mr. Tucker, uh, thank you. I think we're building about six or so built office type buildings a year. That's a that's a rough guess. Okay, thank you. And then, and getting back to the questions that kind of was alluded to earlier about a residential type of design versus like a a glass wall design. I mean, architects and staff throw around words like punched windows. And can you help us understand like what the residential typology is, I mean, getting at the realtor's concerns about, well, this is going to drive up the cost of rental, tenant housing rental. And I'm just wondering if that's something that we would think a lot of the new buildings would fall under this ordinance based on the examples you've shown us so far. Yeah, I think um, as I was trying to mention um, in response to Commissioner Hagenau's question, I, I think that most of the multifamily residential buildings that we've been seeing um, really do have a predominance of another material that's not glass on, on their facades. I think the zoning code actually requires upper level residential to have 15% glass coverage um, at, as a minimum. And that's well below the threshold that this particular ordinance would, would relate to. So I think your, you know, your typical um, window size uh, in, in those buildings is probably, I'm, this is this is purely a guess, but uh, it's probably, you know, four by six, four by eight. Um, if it's floor to ceiling, maybe it's closer to that 50 threshold that, that we've been talking about. Um, but I think, you know, if this ordinance is established, it would be very, very easy for designers to come up with um, you know, buildings that have less glass on their facades than would trigger the thresholds in this ordinance. And, and I think if we looked at several of the recently approved multifamily residential projects, we would see something similar to the graphic that Chris showed um, when he showed the 131 South Fair Oaks project that's under construction today. We're just, you know, on a few portions of the building um, this ordinance would be triggered, but by and large, most of the windows would are, are small enough so that they would not trigger this requirement. And one more kind of set of questions before I give up the floor. Um, in, in Matt's presentation, he briefly talked about three different proposed changes to this ordinance. 
And one of them was about either we more clearly define what the open landscape area is or or if we want that to be covered, then we need to have some kind of um, text amendment type of definition, I assume. But can, I mean, we encourage developers to have green roofs and green outdoor space. What's the difference between a patio? Is it the percentage of like grassy or tree-like things, you know, versus hardscape? Like what, how do we, if you were gonna just throw a, a de definition of a patio at us, Matt or Heather, right. what would it, what would the components of it be? Well, I think I can try this one, Heather. I think it's a it's a feature that has landscaping that is designed, or by and large, will end up having like harborage and space for to attract birds. So it would have to have be more than just a, um, you know, like a treatment at the grade of the patio. It would have to have a mix of you know shrubs and trees and other types of things, uh, and it has to be of some substance or size that. Um, that uh, uh, um, one could measure that would be considered adequate for it to be that type of a thing. Right now, what we have, what we see are basically paved areas uh, uh, on roofs with planters because people don't want to design roofs to support um, a lot of landscaping. It's a very expensive roof to build and a very expensive roof to uh, maintain. I know some of you, Alder Heck particularly, is aware of what's involved in maintaining a rooftop uh, landscaped uh, area. Um, so, I mean, it's something we can figure out. It's it's uh, we would just have to put it into our machine and create something that makes sense. But you're thinking right now, Matt, is to take it out until unless and maybe reconsider it later. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's. That too. I don't think it's necessary at this point in time. Okay, thank you. That's all I got for now. Thank you. Commissioner Solheim. Um, in in the staff presentation, there were the slides that kind of showed how the ordinance would impact existing buildings, which was really helpful. One of them um, was the Arden on East Wash. And I know that this is hard to estimate, but I was just wondering if there was any kind of range for what that cost would be. And I'm just trying to like get a general sense in my mind of of, of cost impacts for for an office building like that, if there was that information available. I'm not familiar with such a number for this project. Sorry, what was that? Can you hear me? Yes, barely. Yes. So speak up. Uh, I was just saying that I, I'm not aware of any cost estimates to treat. The, the Arden. Okay. Is there any general, you know, cost information in terms of on a square foot that you came across when doing this research, or can it just vary so much, so much depending on the the type of product used? It looks like Mr. Tucker wanted to weigh in on that. Did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Uh, it varies so much. Uh, mm -hmm. It um, the different the. Uh, levels of treatment, the different types of windows. Buying glass for windows is, it can be like buying a car. I mean, you can get a base model, you can get something that's very fancy. And mm -hmm. and so it, it, it's very difficult for us to, to know. Um, the closest we got was some of the information that Aaron Williams shared with us about the cost estimates that UW has gone through when they were looking mm -hmm. at doing their work. Um, it, um, and maybe, maybe, I remember he spoke a little bit to that when we did a presentation back in February at the Planning Commission. It's really all over the board. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Spencer. Thank you. Uh, this question is, I guess, for Chris, who did the research on the um, ordinances in Toronto, San Francisco. I heard a lot earlier about concerns um, about this ordinance on the development community. And there was particular concern for women-led, um, minority-led uh, development agencies. And so did you run across anything um, in those communities 
uh, Toronto, San Francisco, other communities that um, had had truly adversely impacted development. Did the development go, you know, flee into other areas in the Bay Area? And if if it did negatively um, impact the development community, particularly um, women, minority-led businesses, were there programs in place to help them offset the cost? It's a, it's a good question. I, I did not come across any study, any such studies, but um, I, I would uh, defer to um, Mr. Lenz, as he works nationally, he may have a, a better idea of that. Yeah, I, I do not come across that. Okay, thanks. Any other questions of staff? Seeing none, I would be looking for a motion. Commissioner Cantrell. I will uh, move that we um, forward the proposed uh, bird friendly ordinance to the city council uh, with a favorable recommendation uh, subject to deleting uh, subsection C, uh, which refers to the upper level landscape element, which uh, staff indicated that, that that's probably needs to be further, further studied. Thank you. Um, Alder Rummel. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Um, Commissioner Cantrell, did you wish to speak to your motion? Uh, yes. Uh, this is an issue that we've been discussing for several years at the plan commission level. And, and uh, obviously it's an important issue to uh, some in the, in the, uh, the city. Uh, I am concerned about the cost, but I think that this uh, approach, the approach that staff has come up with uh, is reasonable at this point in time. And, um, and that, that I think that, um, again, this ordinance can be amended over time. And I think that it's a good start. So that's why I'm recommending it be supported. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, any other comments? Um, Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say that I, you know, I've, I've had some skepticism about this ordinance and particularly related to cost. But uh, this evening, hearing the discussion about how design is really uh, the way that you accommodate for the costs uh, convinced me that uh, there is a path forward for this. It's, it's, it's not about retrofitting uh, large glass buildings. It's it's a matter of appropriate design that takes this into consideration. So I just wanted to to reiterate that and say that's why I'm going to be supporting this. Thank you, Alder. Um, Alder Rummel. Thank you. I'm clearly supporting it as since I, along with Alder Furman, are sp as a sponsor. But I just wanted to follow up a little with some of the. Um, ideas that we heard from staff asking for our feedback. And one question was about the corner element and another was about spandrel glass. And I don't really see that called out in the ordinance. And I'm just wondering, you know, what would change if we wanted to look at um, like the corner element should, you know, have be two sides of glass as opposed to just one side and, and then treat a percentage. I'm sorry so, for asking staff a question, but now I'm looking at the ordinance. So are you looking, um, Alder, at wording for a possible amendment for spandrel glass and for the corner element? I'm just asking for where um, the kind of things that would, I don't know if I am asking for that exactly, but yeah, <laughs> thank you. for. So I was asking more for like direction from the plan commission, if they think that's important for us to ask staff to look at that some more, I guess is what I'm getting at. Commissioner Sunquist, did you have something? 
Well, it wasn't an um, answer to that question. So maybe I could, I don't know if you want to see if somebody else has a response to Alder Rommel. No, I don't. So okay. unless she wants to go in a different direction or ask staff or whatever. So apparently not. So Commissioner Sunquist. Yeah, I don't have that much to say. I just really wanted to thank Alder Rummel and Alder Furman um, for championing this and pushing it forward. Um, I agree with what um, Commissioner Cantrell and Alder Heck said. I was a little concerned about the cost, but I think I'm in the same place that they are. Um, this, this, and, and to the pushback, environmental regulations always get pushed back on in terms of costs, which are usually exaggerated. Um, you can go through history. I, I think this is one of those cases. Um, and um, so I think with the, the minor amendment and taking out the uh, landscape roofs, um, this is a really good proposal. And again, thank you to the alders and also to the staff who worked really hard on this, Mr. Wells and, and others. This is, I think this is great. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Are, are there any other, okay. Um, Alder Furman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I also just wanted to really thank staff for all the work they put into this. I think um, uh, we were really um, fortunate um, to learn from a lot of other cities um, that as, as we heard earlier on multiple versions of this and uh, staff put in a ton of time learning from those cities and really putting forward something that was reasonable. Um, we heard tonight that we obviously there are ways we could have made this a lot tougher. And I think in the future, we should certainly learn from what we did tonight and see if there are ways to make it um, um, apply to more buildings, um, maybe different heights, et cetera. Um, but I really do think this is a great start and I am so incredibly appreciative of the work staff put in. So thank you. Thank you, Alder. Seeing no other hands, I am going to make a comment. I am delighted um, that we have this ordinance. I think it's a great start too. I think this is extremely important. And I want to thank Alder Rummel and Alder Furman. They both know, as do several of the rest of you, that I have been very interested in this for, uh, for a while. So thank you to both of them. And thank you to staff who indeed have done um, a great deal um, of research on this. So with that, I will assume unanimous consent of the motion unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, moving on then to agenda item eight. Um, Legistar 60173, 402 through 414 East Washington Avenue, 8 through 12 North Franklin Street and 9 North Hancock Street, Urban Design District 4, Second Alder District, consideration of a demolition permit to allow seven buildings to be demolished, consideration of a conditional use in the urban mixed use district for a multifamily dwelling with more than eight dwelling units, consideration of a conditional use in the UMX district for outdoor recreation, consideration of a conditional use in the UMX district for a new building greater than 20,000 square feet and more than four stories and consideration of a conditional use to construct two additional stories in area eight of the additional height area map in MGO section 28.071 paren 2 paren B to allow construction of a 10 story mixed use building containing 3,300 3, square feet of commercial space and 156 apartments. And we do have a um, Presentation by staff, uh, Tim Parks.
Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission, uh, item number eight is a request to demolish five residential structures, a mixed use building and a commercial building to construct a 10 story mixed use building with 3,300 square feet of ground floor commercial space and 156 apartments. Following the proposed demolition, the 10 story apartment building will be constructed to parallel the East Washington frontage uh, with a 10 foot setback proposed both from East Washington and from North Franklin Street on the northeast of the site and a seven and a half foot setback along North Hancock Street on the west. Uh, the first floor of the U-shaped building will be set back 2.9 feet from the properties to the northwest, which are developed with a three-story apartment building along North Hancock Street and a two and a half story three unit building on North Franklin. Above the first floor, the north wall of the proposed building will step back approximately 10 and a half feet from the northerly lot line for floors two through six, with a further step back proposed for floors seven through 10. The applicant is requesting approval of a demolition permit to raise uh, seven uh, buildings, all but one of which are 100 years old or older, as well as a series of conditional uses to allow construction of the 10 story building on the black face of East Washington between North Hancock and North Franklin streets. Uh, staff has carefully reviewed uh, the project and while we regret the loss of the existing buildings, uh, we believe that the overall development uh, can meet the various standards for approval. Uh, as noted in the report and attached in the legislative file, uh, there are over 50 pages of public comment uh, that have been received by individuals uh, regarding this project, as well as a very uh, thoughtful report prepared by a steering committee of the James Madison Park neighborhood of Capital Neighborhoods, uh, as well as uh, comments that were organized by a nearby cooperative. Uh, we do believe that the uh, plan commission should carefully consider those uh, in determining whether or not the standards can be met. However, uh, staff feels that the proposed development is generally consistent with the downtown core recommendations in both the comprehensive plan and the downtown plan, uh, which recommend development of mixed use projects along the north side of East Washington Avenue to provide more active uses between the Capitol Square and the Capitol East Corridor east of Blair Street. Staff believes that the conditional use standards can be met to allow at least an eight story building to be built on the site, which is consistent with the height recommended in the downtown plan and allowed on the downtown height map in the zoning code without the proposed bonus stories. Uh, we would conclude noting that in order to approve the 10 story building requested by the applicant, the planning commission shall make specific findings regarding conditional use standard number 14. Staff believes that the proposed 10 story building, which will transition to six stories adjacent to the northerly property line can be found consistent with the plan character for the site and the adjacent parcels to the north, which are planned for development in up to six story buildings. If the plan commission finds that the 10 story building meets standard 14B, 14B, my apologies, it should specify how the 10 story building is a demonstrated higher quality building compared to an eight story alternative. I'd be happy to answer any questions after the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. I will open the public hearing. Uh, the first registrant is John Leger, Wana Key in support wishing to speak. And although he says he's not representing anybody, my understanding is that he's representing LZ Ventures, but perhaps he could clarify that. Uh, Mr. Leger. Do we have anybody by that name? A person by that name was on here just recently, but I am not seeing that name on here right now. Okay, then we will move on to the next registrant and come back to him when he um, comes on. Uh, the next registrant is Don O'Crowley 
opposed and wishing to speak to be followed by Sophia Brickford. Um, Ms. O'Crowley. Thank you. Since the downtown plan height map was adopted, the comp plan clearly defines responsible action tonight to identify ways to retain older buildings and places that contribute to the special character of an area or are associated with diverse cultures through the adoption of sub area plans prior to redevelopment pressures. UDC referenced this as a marching down East Washington of redevelopment. This is not part of the East Washington special area plan. The 800 block had a special area plan that displayed how vacant lots could become high rises and transition to the scale of an established neighborhood without destroying it. This is not Highway 151. Return this boulevard's green space and fill it with trees. The premise of this proposal is not to retain the special character. In the height diagrams presented, they're casting a haze of redevelopment over the landmark St. Paul's AME Church, long associated with the first black church in Madison and first black neighborhood, the East Dayton Street National Historic District. It's our responsibility to continue to conserve the special character, which is evidenced in the support of Common Council providing forgivable loans to owner occupants for cost purchasing and renovating existing rental units. Lastly, the comp plan indicates the need to update height maps to better link with the historic preservation plan and ordinance. Uh, three additional items are failed to be reflected in this proposal. The reduced recommended maximum heights for the adopted lamp house plan the review of the adverse effect of looming over the first settlement historic district as this ordinance's adjacency relates to the lot that lies within 200 feet in all directions and the preservation plan prioritizing this as the first area to be independently surveyed to ensure we preserve the history of underrepresented communities thank you thank you Ms. O'Crawley and I am going to do the same thing that I did before. I'm gonna go through all the registrants. So if you have questions, please note those down and we'll um, get to those then at the, at the end. The next registrant is Sophia Brickford, East Washington Avenue, opposed wishing to speak to be followed by Angie Black. Um, Ms. Brickford. Hi. Um it's actually uh, Sophia Richford. Thank um, you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so I'm you know going to try to keep it brief, but I dislike just about everything about this project. I don't see how people came to the conclusion that it fits the downtown plan because it doesn't fit with the neighborhood style at all. It is too big. It overwhelms the neighborhood at the style. I don't like the style. It not only does it not fit, I think it's just plain ugly. Uh, I have to say absolutely no to the extra stories. This building is not exceptional in any way, shape, or form. I'm completely against destroying the old buildings that are there right now. I'm also, against, not just for their historical value, but also because right now a lot of them house affordable apartments and they're planning to destroy these affordable housing units and replace them with luxury apartments. This is gentrification and that is exactly what is killing vibrant neighborhoods in like every city. It's the wrong direction for Madison. I think it's like what we're going through in Madison now, I think we need to recognize that Wisconsin has the worst racial wealth gap in the nation and that, so lack of affordable housing affects people of color like even more. That's the kind of thing we need to be focusing on and not tearing down affordable apartments and replacing them with you know ugly luxury units. Um, in addition to that, I just wanna express that I've had a lot of frustration with this process during a pandemic. Um, so like, you know, not only can we not meet in person to talk about it, uh, the first time the city was talking about it, we couldn't object to. My main problem with this is that it's destroying affordable housing units and historic buildings. But you couldn't talk about that when they're talking about the historical landmarks. You can only talk about the historical landmarks. So, you know, I said I didn't want them destroyed. Uh, and then at the Urban Design Commission, you're only allowed to talk about the design, which I also don't like and I mentioned. And, you know, and now finally, we're around to this where you're allowed to talk about uh, and tell the city that you don't approve of this type of project, that it is wrong for the neighborhood. But, uh, you know, at this point, 
the landlords have already sold these buildings and the people who are living there right now are being displaced during a pandemic. Uh, it's not okay. There's been an appalling lack of concern from the city about this. And I don't understand why this like wasn't even considered. And I guess, you know, that about wraps it up. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Christopher. Um, the next registrant is Angie Black, uh, 222 West Washington Avenue in support, wishing to speak, representing LZ Ventures to be followed by Rowan Davidson. Ms. Black. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'm a member of the project team. Um, try to keep it short here. Uh, the downtown plan is the primary policy document to be used when evaluating development proposals, including the plan's recommended land uses and development intensities needed to accommodate the significant amount of new employment, housing, and mixed use development downtown in downtown anticipated by the plan. The parcel analysis map in the plan identifies only a handful of available infill redevelopment sites downtown, including this site, to accommodate that growth. This project not only meets the goals and standards in the downtown plan, but also in the comprehensive plan and the zoning code. The downtown plan recognizes development in built up urban areas can be challenging and is often more difficult than developing on a greenfield site at the edge of the city and typically involves competing objectives. Those competing objectives often include the height debate, which is a frequent source of contention in downtown redevelopment and infill projects. The maximum building heights map in the downtown plan attempts to guide resolution among those competing objectives, recommending a pattern of maximum building heights in consideration of a number of factors, including among others, the use and scale of recommendations for an area. The height of this proposed project is consistent with the height map and achieves many, many other important goals and objectives of the downtown plan, which cannot be achieved without sufficient height and density. I want to emphasize three goals and objectives that will be achieved with this project, citing both from the downtown plan and the city's equitable development white paper. Number one, sustainability. Downtowns are inherently the most sustainable part of a community. They usually have higher residential densities, more jobs in close proximity to workers, a wider variety of transportation options and more goods, services and activities that are integrated into the urban fabric. This plan recognizes the interrelationships among these and other urban systems and the objectives and recommendations in each theme area advance the goal of having downtown become a leader in sustainability. Number two, transit oriented development. Although it is embedded across all areas of this plan, land use is the cornerstone of the major plan goal of making downtown a model of sustainability. In addition to generally supporting a mix of uses, and relatively higher density, this plan specifically supports the principles of transit oriented, oriented development or TOD. TODs are essentially higher density mixed use development areas that are less automobile centered and are coordinated with and developed in close proximity to existing and planned transit centers. The downtown core state street and west rail districts in particular embody many TOD principles. Finally, number three, and most importantly, density. Providing locations and opportunities for business and residential growth is essential to achieving many of the city's overall goals and implementing many of the recommendations in this plan. This growth is also critical for maintaining the vibrancy thank, of downtown. Thank you, Ms. Black. That concludes your time. Um, moving on then, the next registrant is Rowan Davidson. Um, Clarence Court Madison in support, wishing to speak, representing uh, legacy architecture, um, I think uh, as part as, of LZ uh, Ventures team, to be followed by David Newman. Well, good evening. My name is Rowan Davidson. I'm a historic preservation consultant with legacy architecture, and I have a background in both architectural practice and public history. A few months ago, we collaborated with Noth, Noth and Bruce architects, designers of this project, to produce a study of the history and architecture of the seven buildings on the 400 block of East Washington Avenue. Following an examination of the condition of the buildings and significant primary source research, we produced a brief report, which I believe you have seen. Uh, without going into too much detail about that report and our findings, I am available to address any questions or concerns you may have regarding specifically the site's history. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, moving on then, our next registrant is David Newman, opposed and wishing to speak uh, from Franklin Avenue, Madison, to be followed by Alexander Gallus. Mr. Newman. Uh, there's no person by that name. Okay, um, if he shows, um, let me know. Um, then uh, Alexander Gallus, opposed and wishing to speak, uh, 318 East Mifflin Street, Madison, to be followed by David Schwab. Um, is there a Mr. Gallus? There is not. Okay, um, moving on to David Schwab, 20 North Franklin Street, Madison opposed, wishing to speak, to be followed by Cade Jackson. Mr. Schwab. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Dave Schwab. I live in a housing cooperative on the block of this proposed development, one house away from the site. A small group of us recently circulated a petition around our neighborhood. Almost 400 people responded with over 99% saying they do not approve of this development. Many left detailed comments, most of which have been shared with the commission, which I hope you will read. The overwhelming majority of our neighbors agree the height and scale of this proposed development is not appropriate at all for the James Madison Park neighborhood. Their reaction was the description of this as a 10 story building, whereas the addition of a roof and ground story would mean that those of us on Franklin Street would have a 12 story building towering over us from the highest point of our street. For the people who live here, such a massive luxury high rise will block out the sun for much of the year, severely impacting our quality of life. Our neighbors are very concerned if this development is approved as proposed, it'll be a green light to begin aggressive gentrification of the James Madison Park neighborhood with developers pushing out affordable housing as they already are and blocking out our sunlight sky and views with luxury high rises. In the midst of a pandemic and an uprising for social justice, we cannot ignore the impacts that development decisions have on equity and diversity. Many of the people who live in this neighborhood have never had the chance to have input on the development plan that chops our one block into two different zones. For our neighbors on Franklin to be facing a massive high rise mere feet from their house reflects a planning process that failed to value our existing neighborhood as a vibrant, attractive human scale community with many affordable housing options. Now that residents are trying to make their voices heard, the city should not prioritize developers' desire to build as big as possible over the legitimate concerns of the community. Our neighbors are opposed to an outdated, narrow, and inequitable conception of development that disregards legitimate concerns of community members and treats our neighborhoods as merely raw material for developers' profits and gentrification. I'd like to add just a few concerns from the recent Urban Design Commission meeting. When the issue of shadowing came up, the developer played a video that showed very quickly the shadow during the spring fall equinox. However, they did not show or address the issue of winter shadow, which had been raised. UDC member Rafiq Assad asked the developer to respond to concerns raised by the neighborhood residents about gentrification and the developer declined to do so. Mr. Assad then voted against the proposal. The developer prevented, presented a 10 to six story version and eight story version as if those are the only possible designs. UDC member Craig Wiesensel raised the question of why the developer and the city don't try to come so don't try to compromise with the existing neighborhood rather than viewing this site as an imagined future neighborhood where the affordable housing has been demolished and replaced by six story buildings. This question was not addressed by the developer. Mr. Weisensel then voted against the proposal. City staff made it clear that the city may approve the extra stories, but does not have to. Yet many of the UDC members acted as though because the developer made some minor changes to the design, they were obligated to grant extra height even though the developer did not satisfactorily address concerns raised by members of the neighborhood, echoed by members of the UDC regarding height, mass, winter shadow, and gentrification. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Schwab. That concludes your available time. Um, the next registrant is Cade Jackson, 20 North Franklin Street, Madison, opposed wishing to speak, um, to be followed by Dwayne Johnson. Sarah. I'm not finding a person by the name. Okay. Um, then the next registrant, Dwayne Johnson, 7601 University Avenue, Middleton, in support 
uh, wishing to speak representing the developer LZ Ventures. Mr. Johnson. Hello, we had prepared a presentation that we're hoping can get pulled up. It's not been pulled up yet for okay. AMG or for myself. There it is. If we could go to the third page. I would like to take this opportunity to provide a brief overview of the proposed project. The site is located at the 400 block of East Washington between North Hancock Street and North Franklin Street. The six existing lots are all currently zoned UMX. Our vehicular traffic is a one-way flow in from one-way Franklin and out onto one-way Hancock. This will keep virtually all of the tra traffic out of the James Madison neighborhood. Within our two and a half levels of underground parking, we have 146 car stalls and 174 bike stalls, nearly a one-to-one -one ratio of parking stalls to units. This downtown site is on the East Washington Avenue transit corridor and the future BRT line, and only one block from the Mifflin Street Bike Boulevard. So there are multiple modes of trans transportation available. We have also provided several bike amenities, including a secure bike storage, bike wash area, and both an interior and exterior bike repair station. The exterior bike repair station is intended to be available for general public. The main apartment entry is located centered on East Washington with entries into the commercial spaces located at each corner of East Washington. We have provided larger than required setbacks, which offer nice areas for dense landscaping around the building perimeter. Next slide, please. We designed a more classic form of architecture compared to what is being built further down East Washington. We feel this cla classic urban architecture is appropriate for its context four blocks from the Capitol, and it aligns with the UDD uh, District 4 guidelines, as well as the downtown plan, which recommend with, which has recommendation 41 calling, quote, to establish design standards that result in taller buildings having interested, interesting and varied upper stories and tops. Our sloped roof form provides an area to conceal rooftop mechanical equipment and adds to the classic architecture of the building. Our exterior material palette is all masonry, which is both timeless and durable. We have used this palette to produce a design with a well-defined base, middle, and top to the building. Traditional brick is used on the upper levels with a larger format cast stone masonry used at the base. Next slide, please. This view shows the corner on Hancock and East Washington Avenue, the commercial entries located at each corner, are located at each corner of East Washington, and they'll be visible and welcoming to the neighborhood. Each entry also includes room for possible outdoor seating. All three entries are clearly defined and use a consistent design language. Next slide, please. You can see here that the center plaza also has access to one of the commercial spaces. These spaces along with the landscaping and setbacks on all sides will activate the street and create a very nice pedestrian experience. Next slide. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Johnson. That concludes your time. Um, our next registrant is John LeJay. He is back in the, in the queue now. So we will hear from him uh, from Wanakee uh, in support wishing to speak. And uh, could you clarify, are you representing uh, LZ Ventures? I am, and I apologize for that okay. mistake. I, okay. since you. I'm a principal of LZ, I assume I'm just representing myself. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to give you a, a, a brief background on LZ Ventures and how this project got in front of you tonight. LZ Ventures is uh, a company that my business partner Brad Zellner and I formed. We have been doing projects either in construction or development in Madison for the better part of the last three decades. Um, it, before the uh, 2012 uh, revamp, all of the projects were done by PUD, which was even more contentious and, and uh, harder to unravel than uh, what is before you this evening. When we had the opportunity to assemble this site, when it was brought to us, the first thing we did was look at the downtown plan. The downtown plan identifies the site clearly as being in the downtown core. It identified it as uh, the most dense zoning available to the city. As we um, began the purchase process of the property, we 
dug into the property and uh, wanted to look at what infill meant on that site and what it meant for demolition. We take that very seriously. We've been involved in everything from salvage and raising buildings in Madison to moving structures, to moving structures from one site to another, to moving structures on a current site. Um, to that end, we engaged uh, Roland's firm to do a survey of the property and historical research on it to see if we could verify what was called out in the city plan. And that's that it is an underutilized and a property with obsolete buildings. His conclusion is the same as ours. They're very old, very tired buildings that have served their purpose, have been altered multiple times uh, throughout their lives. And um, it is a perfect infill redevelopment site in Madison. The reason the site was rezoned, I believe, with lots of input from lots of people was to put density on the arterial that is East Washington and the mass transit connection that is East Washington Avenue. Uh, when we first started doing these kind of projects in Madison, East Washington was a far different entrance into the city of Madison. It is now on its way to the vision that many, many people shared of what the entrance to the city could be. This building, if constructed, will house 175 to 200 people that will not be putting pressure on the existing housing stock in the James Madison, Mansion Hill, uh, Tenney Lampham neighborhoods. That is why when the rezoning was done, it was contemplated for this kind of density along this corridor. The buildings that are there are environmentally um, inefficient and they are very inefficient in their land use. It, they will be replaced by a high efficient modern building that houses many people of diverse backgrounds of diverse ideas and diverse ages. Um, to immediately assume gentrification and new development, we think is a misplaced idea. We think that- Mr. Vijay, that yeah. uh, concludes your time. Thank you Thank very you. much. Mm -hmm. um, the next registrant is Randy Bruce, Middleton, Wisconsin, um, in support wishing to speak representing LZ Ventures. Mr. Bruce. Uh, thank you. Uh, if we could pull up that presentation again, that would be great. Uh, so let's skip to the next uh, slide. Uh, so, so what I wanted to do was take this opportunity to explain how we arrived at our design solution and why we believe we meet the conditional use standards for the bonus height. <clears throat> In bonus height area H, the downtown plan specifically provided the bonus height as a design tool to encourage taller buildings that provide continuity with the Capitol Gateway Corridor while also providing a transition to the James Madison Park neighborhood to the north. We use this flexibility to improve the design of the project. The next few slides will illustrate this. This image is of an eight story building with a similar architectural treatment to the proposal in front of you. Uh, it has a larger footprint with setbacks more typical of downtown redevelopment than our proposal, but it has approximately the same buildable area. It's eight stories, it's blocky, uh, but it, it does uh, meet uh, the, uh, the requirements. Next slide, please. So we use this flexibility of the, of the bonus height to increase our building setbacks. The building setbacks don't show yet on this in this image, but. But what we do show is the area that we, the building area that we took off of the building and then moved towards the East Washington Avenue corridor. Um, next slide, please. And this shows the reduction and the addition. Um, we used uh, uh, the, um, um, excuse me, sorry. If you could go to the next slide, please. This, this shows our final design, which shows a taller, more slender building on East Washington Avenue that is consistent with the goals of the bonus height area H and the downtown plan. The building uh, steps down by four stories with six story wings that are now of a scale and uh, height that is more compatible with the neighborhood. Next slide, please. The, the image, uh, this image shows in yellow a building envelope of eight stories 
that meets the setbacks and floor to floor heights of the downtown plan and the zoning code. Our six and 10 story building fit, fits well within this envelope. Uh, and you can see, in fact, that we're not uh, taking as, as much building envelope as we, as we could. Also, you can note that we're well below the capital view limit. Uh, we're over 20 feet below the capital view limit. Next slide, please. This image places our building within the planned context of the neighborhood. The orange building envelopes are from the height map outlined in the downtown plan and the bonus height allowed us to design a building that better meets the goals of the downtown plan and to match into the proposed six story heights for the remainder of the block on uh, Franklin and on Hancock, as well as meeting the, uh, the height uh, proposals for East Washington. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bruce. That concludes your available time. Uh, the next registrant is Andrea Friesen 20 North Franklin Street, Madison, opposed, wishing to speak. To be followed by Ian Graves. Hi, uh, my name is Andrea Friesen and I'm a resident one house away from the proposed site on North Franklin. I've lived here for four years and I also live in a housing cooperative. I've attended two of the last Urban Design Commission meetings and there was little discussion about concerns addressed by the neighborhood. From my understanding, the Urban Design Commission based their approval on a future plan of the neighborhood, not the current plan. The future plan allows for the rest of the block to be redeveloped up to six stories, as you just saw previously. Um, and from my understanding, the UDC approved this with the future develop in mind. Uh, meaning that the rest of the block would eventually be demolished. I live one house away from this development in a housing cooperative. The house behind mine was also purchased by our organization and is being turned into a housing cooperative. So both housing co-ops are on this street of the development plan. Madison has publicly recognized that housing cooperatives fall under current best practices and is a strategy that is currently being implemented by our city. Our houses are considered a best practice in terms of equitable development, but in this current scenario, the city is suggesting that our cooperative houses would eventually be demolished and redeveloped. I urge this plan commission to lean on the side of equity to think about the neighborhood and to envision this development without demolishing the rest of the block. I would like the plan commission to address my concerns about the future plans of this block and how that has been a leading force in this approval of the current proposed development. I would also like to request the commissioners to have an open conversation around gentrification and displacement in relation to this development and neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Friesen. Um, the next registrant is Ian Graves, uh, 116 East Gilman Street, Madison opposed, wishing to speak, to be followed by Araceli Esparza. Sorry, I probably did not pronounce that correctly. Um, uh, Mr. Graves. There's no person uh, with that uh, with I and Graves. Uh, okay, then uh, we're on to the next registrant, um, uh, Araceli Esperanza. There. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Araceli Esperanza. I'm a longtime Eastside resident. I own a home, not near this plant. And I want to acknowledge that most of the people who've been speaking for it don't live here in Madison now currently. They might have worked and moved people out of certain places and like build structures here, but to really be a homeowner and tax owner and drive down these streets every day is a different reality. And many of us, and in fact, I would think that some of the people on the council as well, probably drive down East Wash fairly, you know, on a regular basis. In fact, I'm only like one block away from East Watch right now. And to say that, the let's take the example of what happened in the 700 block. 
And what's happened at the AC hotel on Blair is horrible. We are almost knocking into people because they, they're not responsible. You say you're going to put all these bikes places and, and parking lots and, and you're going to you know give back to the community. Look at us. We cut off half the building for you. That's not enough. You've taken a lot of space and you're taking a lot of homes and people who are living there and you're painted so badly that now it's COVID and you're going and all the places have been apparently and this is my maybe third time hearing about this conversation and at every committee level and I think some who was posing spoke to this that the process itself has been just oh my gosh it's horrible and every process that it's been it's like not taking the human element that's living there now in consideration so when we talk about equity and so and all of these things and then you about how it's detrimental to communities of color who live there right now and are renting at a lower rate. And you expect us who are paying and who will end up having to pay more on their property taxes to help you guys to do this building that will only cover up apparently half of this, you know, another neighborhood and be put in the dark. You're creating a, a natural eclipse. We already have that. We've had it a couple of times now on East Wash. I think this is enough. And you're telling me that, oh, this is all part of the larger plan that we had for East Washington. Really, was it? And I don't know if we can plan things and then experience them later and not say that we can't change those plans. Because I think no one understood how much traffic is going to happen and how much chaos that traffic brings to our everyday commute and livelihood and quality of air and quality of life that we want to live. There is a, there is a breaking point to some of these mid-sized cities. And I think that by putting this bu building up in a way that's going to just destroy some of the character, some of that naturalness that we want so that people can relax from those high rises, from seeing obscure, having an obscure view of the sunset. It's important. And I think it's, I think it's interesting how too, and I know my time's gonna come up here right before I say it, you're gonna say, oh no, it's not gentrification. They give me a better word than that because there's no other better word than carrying out stuff, building, taking people out of their homes, who they've been living there for a long time, taking away low income housing and and destroying a scenery. Thank I think you, that's a better word. Awesome. Find it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair uh, uh, Ian Graves is now uh, on the list. Okay, go ahead with Mr. Graves to be followed by Robert Lewin. Uh, Ian Graves, uh, 116 East Gilman Street, opposed, wishing to speak. Hi, I'm giving it to Becca Schober, who's actually one building over from the development. Yeah, hi, I'm Becca. Um, um, I, we, we will need to have Becca register. I um, registered as available for questions. Okay, so we do have your registration yes. information then? Yes, I'm just here with Ian, so. Okay, go ahead. Um, all right, thank you. Um, but yeah, like Ian said, I live at 16 North Franklin right next to the proposed development. Hello, can you yes. guys hear me? Yes, okay. we can, go ahead. <laughs> um, I live right next to the proposed development. Um, as it stands, it would have a huge impact on the amount of sunlight that the entire block gets. Honestly, it casts a shadow for a good part of the year so I feel like the quality of life for the rest of the block is going to be greatly, greatly decreased. Um, and I do also want to second Sophia's voice when she said that all this is happening in the midst of a pandemic. People are being displaced in a pandemic and it's, I don't think it's very ethical. And I, I honestly really just wanted to say that I'd like to point out that the only people who have spoken tonight thus far in support of this proposal are the people who will directly profit from it and all of the voices of the people who is going to affect that you have heard have been opposed. So I would just like to point that out and I would like to also echo about the Black Lives Matter movement and the obvious blatant gentrification that this project represents. There's going to be a luxury rooftop pool overlooking a homeless shelter that's been there for I want to say 40 years. I mean, how much clearer can it get with what they're doing? This is gentrification in the middle of global protests fighting just that. Look what it's done in our own city. Please just listen to the people on this one. The people are saying, no, it's not a good idea. Please 
just hear the voice of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schober. Um, okay, the next registrant is Robert Lewin, 123 West Washington Avenue in support wishing to speak to be followed by Alexandria uh, Demers. Uh, Mr. Lewin. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I live on uh, West Washington. I know this is a East Washington, but in the three hours I've been waiting to give my two cents worth, I could have walked to this site and back 15 times. This is my neighborhood as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I moved downtown five years ago. I wanna speak in support of this project. I have no interest in it. Uh, previous speaker, Rebecca said, um, no one has spoken for this who isn't in the development. Well, I'm the exception to break that rule. I support it because the parcel has looked old and tired for 10 years, and it looks even older and more tired now that we've seen the Sylvie, the American Family Spark, the Festival Foods Galaxy, the Marlene Project, and other, uh, other improvements up and down East Washington from, uh, from the AC Hotel all the way out to East Town. I, I keep thinking that Madison has identified that we need a thousand or more new housing units, apartments, each year for many years to come to keep up with our population. And uh, we need a good portion of that development to be downtown. Um, I know that uh, it means taking down older buildings and putting up new, but you know what? Those older buildings were new and replaced an older building you know, generations before. If, if we don't do it downtown and, and do infill, and we're telling developers, you know, go out to Verona, go out to Delafield, go out to Deerfield, you know, go to the hinterlands, and then all that tax base doesn't come to Madison, it goes to, you know, the suburbs or the, the rural areas where where some people would uh, would wish. I think having a development of this size on the 400, East Washington block makes sense. It's uh, urban infill. Urban infill requires taller buildings. If you insisted that they have affordable units within this new building, you might have to allow them to, to add another eight stories to it because you know the more units, the, the, uh, the more uh, you can amortize the cost of doing it. And the city isn't gonna allow for a 15 or 18 story building anywhere. So I uh, like what I see. I have no vested interest in it. I think it's time. Um, and over time, those older two-story houses that are, you know, the most concerned. And I guess if I lived on that street, I'd, I'd share that concern, um, are going to be replaced by four or six-story buildings. Whether you like it, I like it. It's just a matter of time because the land downtown is that valuable. So I'm available for questions. Otherwise, I appreciate you hearing me. This is the kind of development that helps Madison, even though some people are displaced. Thank you, Mr. Lewin. Um, our next registrant is Alexandra Demers, 15 North Hancock Street, Madison, opposed, wishing to speak, to be followed by Anthony Brillis. Brilski, um, Ms. Demers. All right. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, so first off, I would like to address some of the um, points in favor of this that have been brought up over the course of this evening specifically. One of the developers talked about the importance of having a building that's mixed use with built, uh, businesses on the ground floor. I can say from experience living literally right next to where this building would be built. The similar buildings in this neighborhood people who live in my building can't afford to patronize those businesses. These businesses being built are for the people who live right upstairs. They are not for the people who live next door. So I just wanted to put that on the record. I also think it's disingenuous to say that this is not gentrification, to imply that people from multiple economic strata can live in this building. This building is being marketed as luxury apartments. There is no mention yet of affordable housing. All of the people who've been displaced, are they going to get apartments in there? No, it's not for them. This is for people coming in from outside. And I am not opposed to people moving in. I am not opposed to greater housing density. 
I just think that there are better ways to go about this. Um, I also think that it's disingenuous to call houses an inefficient use of land. We all know that apartments are cheaper, or sorry, apartments are denser than houses, but that doesn't mean that houses have no value or significance. They are part of the neighborhood and they have value for what they are. It doesn't have to be all about cramming as many people into a small space as possible, although density is important in a downtown area. Um, my points that I had wanted to bring up before this meeting, um, other people have raised this. The fact that this is being pushed through during a pandemic is very underhanded, it feels. The only public notice that we received of this hearing is a poster outside of one of the buildings slated for demolition. It's on the side street um, and it gives the physical location of the county building to go to the meeting. So anybody who thought they could show up and speak would show up to an empty building. This is being held over Zoom. Somebody who doesn't wanna leave their house uh, wouldn't go show up at the meeting and they wouldn't check Zoom because we had no way of knowing that this was going to be here unless we actively looked for this information. Um, and the fact that this is a virtual meeting also alienates people who struggle to use technology. Um, and Tim Park said earlier that uh, staff supports this development that completely ignores the over 400 people local to here who have signed a petition against this. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up is that this is an inappropriate structure. It's massive, the shadow is disproportionate. I would not get sun for the vast majority of the year. Um, it's antithetical to appropriate and healthy neighborhood development. I, like I said earlier, I'm not opposed to dis construction, demolition development in my backyard. That is not the problem. I want to see asset-based community growth and development and investment. If these houses look dingy, make the landlords maintain the property better. We don't have the power to- Thank you, Thank you Ms. Demers. That concludes your available time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next registrant is Anthony Brilski. Um, 911 East Johnson Street, Madison opposed and wishing to speak to be followed by Bob Kleba. Mr. Brilski. Hello. Hello. Um, so I made my list of pros and cons. Um, in my case, I supported this development for the majority of the time that it's been up for public discussion. Um, I literally changed my mind in one of the meetings, I believe it was the Urban Design Commission, where I signed in in support and then uh, called the project a diamond encrusted middle finger to the rest of the neighborhood. Um, my concern is that yes, density is super important. Yes, property taxes are super important. Uh, having housing on the bus corridors is super important, but the people benefiting from that bus corridor are people who are least likely to use it. They're going to have a parking space per unit uh, in the, the lower levels. And they are not all that likely to use the bus much. The people who really need to use the bus are the people who need to get to their jobs all over the city. And a downtown location for the people of the working class would be fantastic. Um, the other reason I supported the project was I had worked uh, on the steering committees for the Salvation Army uh, expansion. And that project was open to change and fixing issues. Um, this project has been open to nothing. Oh, except for some cosmetic stuff on the roof and for adding a bike repair station, apparently. Um, now, I could care less about the loss of these specific old buildings. The orange brick one is kind of neat. And if it can be moved somewhere else, that would be great. But it's not my priority. Uh, my concern is there's a comparably sized development going up on the site of Ellis Deli. Why is that one halfway to Sun Prairie and this one is right next to the urban core? Why can't we have it? so that the more affordably priced housing is closer to where the jobs are and the people who can actually drive everywhere because they all have cars, uh, why can't they go further out on the fringe? 
Um, this project literally increases segregation to say nothing of integration. Um, there's no other way to slice that and to ignore that issue again in another meeting uh, really would mark the committee as tone deaf. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brilski. Um, the next registrant is Bob Kleba, 704 East Gorham Street, Madison, opposed and wishing to speak. Mr. Kleba. Mr. Kleba? You are unmuted, go ahead and speak. Mr. Kleba, are you muted on your end? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. All right, somebody unplugged my microphone. Um, okay, first I wanna correct some inaccuracies about the way that the steering committee has been presented by the developer. The majority of people participating are from the immediate area. For example, at the last UDC meeting, 66 people registered, 16 were not from the immediate neighborhood, five of the 16 were associated with the applicant. Of the 66, a total of seven registered in support, five of those were in support were associated with the applicant. Thus, 59 of the 61 registered non-applicants opposed this proposal. The large majority of the steering committee opposed this uh, development. Overall, as we documented in the steering committee report, this proposed development does not meet the plan commission standards of approval and does not fit in the James Madison Park neighborhood. The proposal demolishes affordable housing and replaces it with luxury apartments that will make the immediate neighbor's properties unlivable with the, with the intense shadowing in winter. It threatens the livability of a dynamic and vibrant neighborhood. It is an example of what the city's equitable development report cites as creating displacement and gentrification. The steering committee have been surprised that the focus of the developer has been how to maximize the massing and profit on the proposed site rather than how best to work with the neighborhood. Offering a public bicycle repair station does not make up for such a gross disregard for a lack of integration with our downtown neighborhood. In order to preserve the historic architecture of our 150 year old city for the development of the site, I asked the commission to require as a condition of approval the relocation of the two significant buildings on East Washington Avenue. It is not uncommon for developments in location like, locations like this to work with the neighborhood and the city to preserve our shared architectural history. Last, I asked the plan commission to keep in mind that the six block sized Madison, James Madison Park neighborhood suffers from a lack of organization it was never able to respond to the current zoning allowing the greater heights at eight, six, and four stories. If it is the desire of the commission to start the process of demolishing a large part of the historic fabric of downtown Madison, let it begin with this 12 and a half story tall proposal. If the commission want to follow the downtown plan and maintain the rhythm of the two and three story homes in James Madison Park, let's ask the developer to come back with a shorter building at six or four stories. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kleba. That concludes the number of uh, the people who registered um, and uh, wish to speak. I will read into the record those who do not wish to speak but are available to answer questions. Justin Zampardi, uh, Furrier Drive, Madison, in support not wishing to speak from Beerbecker representing LZ Ventures. Um, Megan Hellendberg opposed uh, from Jennifer Street, Madison, not wishing to speak, available to answer questions. Benny Ramirez, Superior Street, Madison, opposed, available to answer questions. Jenny Gao, East Dayton Street, Madison, opposed, available to answer questions. Oh, uh, here's a, um, a repeat. Um, so, that is it. Now we have- uh, ch Chair, we have uh, one one that came in kind of late. Um, we have uh, Mariah Renz. Um, that registered to speak? Uh, correct. Uh, Heather, do you have that information? 
I would need to run the report again. I didn't get it on my latest version. So um, if you have it in front of you, Jesse. Yeah, yeah if that's okay, Chair. I can read that. Yes, off. please read that into the okay. record. I have uh, Mariah Renz, 23 North Franklin Street, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, posed, wishing to speak. Okay, go ahead. Ms. Renz? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak. I have lived and worked downtown and the near east side since moving to Madison in 2006. I'm a service industry professional, restaurant, bar manager, and own my home at 23 North Franklin Street across from the proposed development. We are lucky to have a vibrant downtown known for a dynamic and nationally recognized bar and restaurant scene. Our food and drink scene draws on people from all over Madison, out of town visitors, and those who work and live in the downtown to keep it strong. There are over 100 restaurants and bars relying directly on wage workers, service industry professionals, and part-time help, not only to fill positions, but in turn to be part of the community that frequents their establishments. The James Park uh, Madison neighborhood is home to many of my coworkers, friends, people who are longtime renters and new homeowners. These people like me have chosen to live here because it is charming, affordable neighborhood, close to work, a grocery store, and amenities of the walkable downtown. As a city, we need to take care when developing this neighborhood that we don't force the people who have historically lived here out and allow for more one note luxury apartments that will push out diversity and create a downtown that is only for those with means instead of those who work hard to keep the whole system running. Affordability is not the only issue that I have with this proposed development. I chose to buy my two story, 1000 square foot home in 2010 and immediately received a loan from the city to remodel, improve and make my house, which was once a rental into a home. When I sit on my front porch, I see two to three story houses, gardens and front yards, a view down, lake, down the street to Lake Mendota in the sun and the sky. The proposed building is too big for this neighborhood. I understand that Madison needs to increase density, but to allow something of this mass and height into a neighborhood that is mostly two-story homes feels so inappropriate. It feels like both the city and developers are taking advantage of a community that has never been able to have their voice heard on these issues. Me and members of the Avalon Co-op created a petition and survey to educate people about the development and get neighborhood feedback. Over 180 of the almost 400 people who responded wrote personal comments that we shared with the council ahead of time. I hope each of you has read these comments and consider how your decision today will directly affect the people of this community. These are people who have historically have had no voice in the downtown plan and it's your responsibility to hear them now. I would like end by requesting that the developer show an image from my house, which would be on the North Franklin side of this development where it's roughly 11 and a half stories high next to a two story home, if that's possible. And thank you for your listening. Um, thank you, thank you, Ms. Renz. Um, we may see that uh, later, but not not right now. Thank you. Um, okay, I have read the folks into the um, register that um, did not wish to speak, but are available to answer questions. There are about 40 more who registered in opposition, not wishing to speak two who registered neither um, for or against not wishing to speak and about five who reg registered in support not wishing to speak. Um, are there any questions for any of the speakers or the registrants who indicated they were available to answer questions? Commissioner Solheim. Yes, I had a question for the development team. Um, perhaps Mr. Johnson. Okay. Um, there was the, the slides uh, that referenced the eight story version versus 10 story. And I was just wondering, um, since you showed how a portion of the building was essentially moved to uh, East Wash, is it the same number of units in both scenarios or um, has that and anything else in terms of the, you know, the statistics of the building changed under those two? Mr. Johnson? 
Yeah, hello. Yeah, it's uh, roughly the same number of units moving it from the back neighborhood side up to the East Wash side. Okay. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in also hearing from the development team. I, I, I know they were a little rushed with some of their presentation. Um, I'd like to, to see the shadow studies that were in their presentation uh, where they compared the eight story version to the 10 story version and its shadow impacts. And in their submitted presentation, it was only for the equinoxes and I'd like to also look at what the summer and winter solstice shadow patterns are, even if it's not for comparing the eight and 10 story building, but some version of, so we can get an idea of what the shadow impacts are in the winter and summer also. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, so if we could go to slide number 14 in the presentation. I believe we'd be back. Yeah, there we go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So this shows the 9 a.m. Um, and we're in the spring fall equinox. So I guess we started with this one knowing that it's kind of half in between. So half the year is going to be better and half the year is going to be worse. The red red areas show the eight story version that Randy, Randy had shown. And then the blue shows the 10 story and obviously where those merge together is the purple. So this is at 9 a.m. during the spring and fall equinox. And then if we go to the next one, that's the noon spring and fall equinox. And then one more is the three o'clock, I believe, 3 p.m. Um, again, spring and fall equinox. So we did submit other um, another study that showed the winter and summer equinox as well. That's within the packet that went out. You guys have that available. I could point you in the direction of of where that study would be located. I think that would be helpful. Okay. So, in our uh, uh, urban design submittal or the most recent submittal, I think in your project plans that are on the plan commission site, it's in there. Right. So, I mean, I have it up on my screen. I don't know if I can share my screen or if. Somebody can pull that up. There we go. So this shows on the left side the spring fall equinox that we just looked at. And then the middle one is the summer solstice. And then the far right is the winter solstice. And we took those same times, the 9 a.m., 12, and, and 3 o'clock. As you can imagine, in the winter, the 9 a.m., it's the sun has just risen, unfortunately. So they're, you know, the whole block's in shadow from all the different buildings. And then at noon, we're casting shadows back in the neighborhood behind. And then by three o'clock, kind of the same thing. We're back more towards East Wash. And then in the summer, the sun's obviously extremely high. So there's not nearly as much shadow cast in the nine, and that's on the far left, at the 9 a.m. and the, the noon and then back to the three o'clock. So can you, uh, sorry, can you blow that up again? And uh, let us just kind of look at, let's say focus on summer because, uh, you know, there's concern I think about ability to even have a garden given the height, the proposed height of the building. So I wanna think about that in terms of, in the, in the context of what you're showing. Uh, noon, it looks like it wouldn't really have much of an impact or, and the sun is behind the building at 3 p.m. essentially in the summer. Uh, and, and how did it look at 9 a.m. in the summer? Right, it's off because of the angle we're at, it's off to the side quite a bit at, at nine as it rises. Okay, and then I'd say looking at the winter, uh, you know, you, at, at noon, that's a, to me, that's a substantial impact. 
and uh, even looking I, uh, that's you know, you could, the shadow to me looks like it's stretching all the way to East Mifflin, although I guess you could say St. John's. Right, the church is doing a similar thing, right? You know, it's not as tall, so the shadow is probably half the length. Um, shadow, and then at, at 3 p.m. Right, there it's moved to the side quite a bit, so more of the Franklin side. Mm -hmm. But the other buildings are shadowing other parts, obviously. And then maybe since we're at, at this point, maybe you can go over to the equinox portion of it. Um, since we've got them all on the same page. That, uh, that looks... Uh, mm, like a pretty big shadow there, I guess, at 9 a.m. Right. And some of those are the other buildings too, obviously. We didn't take out the other building shadows, which we, I guess, could look at. If we, if we uh, those, those buildings are pretty short comparatively, but, and there the couple of two or three houses are impacted pretty severely um, at noon in the, at the equinox. And then across Franklin later in the day. Okay, um, that's that's all I had about the shadows. Thanks. Do you have additional questions, Alder Heck? Um, not quite yet. Are there other questions for any of the registrants? Commissioner Cantrell. Yes, this is, I guess, of the architect. Um, the, what, the projects, that, the project that you're showing us with the um, with the um, gabled roof and and the rounded corners, is that what the urban design approved? So we are looking for Randy Bruce then? Uh, I guess, yes. Okay. Um, that is correct. The Urban Design Commission approved our six story and 10 story uh, building um, as, it, as it has been shown this evening. The one condition that they had was for us to go back to a prior uh, design iteration regarding the corners uh, at, at, the, at the ground floor plane. Uh, we had, uh, had shown them a, both a curved corner and a rectilinear corner, and they approved the design with a rectilinear corner. That is what we showed you uh, on our screen this evening. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one other question, and I, I don't know if it's for you, Randy, or is, uh, I'm assuming these are all market rate units? Uh, that is correct. They are all mar market rate. Okay, thank you. Is that all the questions you have, Commissioner? Uh, at this time, thanks. Okay, thank you. Alder Hack. Thank you. Uh, this is for any of the development team. Uh, can you describe your uh, uh, thoughts for uh, the various types of delivery vehicles and things like Eat Street and Grubhub and Uber and Lyft and all these delivery vehicles? I don't see any loading area for to accommodate the increasing need to, to do so. Mr. Bruce, is that something you can take or do you want Mr. Johnson to take it or Mr. Leger? Uh, I think I can take that. I can take okay. that. Okay. Uh, I think there's two opportunities for us there, uh, Alder Heck. Uh, one um, would, would be to look uh, for a delivery zone uh, area on East Washington um, that would allow for uh, short-term deliveries. The, the other would be uh, to, uh, to use um, uh, one of the
one of the one of the uh, garage uh, vehicular entry or uh, points uh, for a um, short-term loading as well. Um, I think that those those are two two options for us. This one, as part of the city comments, they have asked for a, um, a delivery vehicle management plan. Uh, we got that request on Friday. Uh, we have not prepared that yet, but we're we're happy to do so. Thank you. My my uh, my experience is that the delivery drivers, at least for the uh, Grubhub and such take the path of least resistance. So I can't imagine them driving into the garage and parking in a designated spot. They'll probably drive up the stairs to the front entrance on East Washington. Um, all right, that's interesting. Uh, that's it for now, thanks. Are there other questions for registrants? Are there any other questions for registrants? Alder Heck. Thanks. Um, some of these are related to conditions of approval that might involve staff discussion also, but I'll put them out there to the developer now. And then if you have a reaction, um, uh, you know, we, we can, I can discuss it with staff later and that, in that portion of the meeting. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, as, as we've heard, there are some lovely uh, buildings with some history behind them on this site. And uh, it's, it's a shame to see them just demolished. They, they're, there's a couple of them in particular. I, I'm, I think it's 402 and 410, I guess the, the one that has a high probability of being a Claude and Stark residence. And uh, I, I'd be interested uh, if, uh, if this is approved that we put a condition of approval to wait 60 days for any demolition and that the development team would be responsible for uh, promoting uh, the, the moving of those to a, a site that would accept them uh, and and at least be responsible for paying for the the marketing of, of the availability of those two properties. Uh, so I'm interested in knowing if you're uh, willing to accept that condition if it comes up. And then also, uh, I, I, you know, that we've heard about the pandemic and the difficulty that uh, people, I mean, there, there are a lot of written notes about this in the, in the petition and elsewhere in the report, the uh, steering committee report about people having trouble finding housing due to the pandemic, especially uh, housing uh, with comparable rents anywhere in the city center, uh, particularly because uh, you know, by April or so, at the latest, most affordable apartments in the downtown area have already been scooped up for the following year. And so there, it's very difficult for people to find housing. So I'd also be interested in knowing if uh, you'd be willing to accept uh, allowing uh, current tenants, if this is approved, to stay in their homes if they so desire, at least through, let's say, October. So two questions there. So um, is that a Mr. Johnson? Um, I think that would be best that if Angie Black took that question. Okay, Angie Black. Thanks. Um, Thanks for the question, Patrick. Um, so yes, <clears throat> the short answer to that question is yes. I think that that is a, a definitely a feasible plan uh, through the end of October, uh, given you know the timing of all projects. That's that's something we could accommodate. And and I just want to 
let folks know that nobody has been kicked out of their unit. We have, once we purchased the property, which um, from prior meetings that you were in attendance at, folks knew that uh, we did not yet own the property. So we were not in a position to reach out to existing tenants, but we, we have done that and have already offered to extend people and allow them to stay longer should they choose to do so at their current rent um, beyond when their current leases uh, expire. Um, not a lot of folks have taken us up on that, but we've offered it to all current tenants. So um, I, there's not a problem offering that through October. It's currently offered to everybody through the end of September. And, and concerning the house uh, moves, potential for house moves? Um, well, we, we have always remained willing to work with somebody that has an interest in taking the houses. I, in terms of marketing, I'd have to talk to my client. I do know we, we have experience with that as you are aware. Um, you know, obviously we would need to, there has to be a site and we have offered that in prior meetings. So I, I don't anticipate that a, a 60 day period where we would make that available to work with somebody if they have a receiving site. I don't anticipate that would be an issue. Alder Heck. Thanks. I, I, I believe in some recent uh, demolition uh, requests that we've had on at plan commission. We've asked for some advertising to be done uh, that I don't think is uh, we're not expecting a nationwide effort or something, but there, uh, I think there are some uh, some conditions of approval that we can uh, resurrect from recent similar experiences and, and discuss those later. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it for now. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna follow that up since uh, uh, Ms. Black's um, up. It, it does say in our conditions uh, that we need to consider the reasonableness of efforts to relocate um, buildings to be demolished, including but not limited to the cost of relocation, the structural soundness of the building. Um, and so I'm wondering, I, I, what, I'm not clear on what you have done to date on um, attempting to um, potentially relocate those buildings. If, uh, if you could tech facilitator unmute Ms. Black. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks for the questions, Liddell. So uh, a couple of things. Um, one is um, in talking with Alder Heck, which we've been doing for a number of months, um, he actually put us in contact with a specific property owner that might be interested. And we did um, provide the information to them, but ultimately they decided to build a new house on their available parcel. So that was one avenue we explored. Um, the other avenue we explored when the, the issue of relocation came up um, at the steering committee is that we did provide um, sort of willingness and information about how to work through that process to the chair who is no longer the chair of the steering committee. Um, he was asked to, it, he's no longer the chair. So we had communicated that with him at some point to say, you know, we're always willing to talk about that um, we need. We also need the resources to find a place for it to go. It's not always so much about cost as it is about finding a location to put a building, um, particularly when you do have older buildings like this that um, really are not structurally sound and arch architecturally intact. People start looking at the opportunity and, and what it takes to receive a house on a site that might be available and, and it gets a little more daunting, but we did um, put that information out um, when it was suggested to us. Cause as you know, we have in fact, as a development team um, done house relocation, relocation several times in Madison. So that's what we've done so far um, in terms of, of the actual ability to move the houses based on their condition. That would be a question I'd, I'd ask you to kick over to Rowan. Okay, thank you, Ms. Black. But um, are there other uh, questions of any of the registrants? Uh, 
chair, I think that we did track down David Newman, uh, who had registered to speak earlier. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, sorry, my that's my girlfriend's uh, name. I tried okay. logging in and out. And, okay, uh, got it. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Newman. Hi, thanks for having me a little bit late. Um, yeah, I'm David Newman. I live about one block away from the proposed site on Franklin Avenue. I'm in opposition. Um, just, you know, you've heard it before, but the building is too large to integrate with this neighborhood. Um, Randy Bruce showed the building earlier in the presentation on Hancock Street. But on the lower corner on Franklin Avenue, it's about 136 feet, which is probably at least 11 stories, um, top to bottom. The area is zoned for eight stories with a possible bonus of two. But I, you know, I don't see any reason to approve these bonus levels, especially considering how tall it is. Um, to further that point, there are other large buildings on East Wash that are very successful, like the Constellation, the Galaxy, the Lyric buildings, and the future Arden building. All of these buildings have large green space buffers or other step down buildings in between them and the other residential areas, unlike this proposal, which is directly next to that two and three story building. Um, the back, uh, you know, the, over there is Reynolds Park and Bree Stevens Field, which kind of break it up, as well as like the uh, back of the Lyric building, which is only three stories and is a much more appropriate step down height than the six stories for this proposed building. Uh, it doesn't integrate naturally with the neighborhood. Uh, you know, you saw the shade, too much shade, and will reduce sunlight for a number of buildings nearby. Um, this is a very walkable neighborhood. I used to walk to and from work, um, and there's a bike boulevard on Mifflin Street, uh, intersecting Franklin and Hancock. There's already a lot of foot and bicycle traffic there. Um, there's a roundabout on Franklin that causes a lot of confusion. Many vehicles don't follow the rules the wrong way. And I just see any new building of this scale with you know 140 extra vehicles that can cause a lot of extra traffic here, can pose a danger, especially with the number of cars in the morning or um, you know, delivery vehicles, Eat Street, et cetera. I don't see Eat Street using a garage spot, no way. Um, lastly, this is a residential neighborhood of mostly houses and short three-story apartment buildings. It's just kind of disingenuous to say it's a good fit from the neighborhood. Uh, thanks for having me, especially late in the hour. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Um, Okay, we will go back to questions of any of the registrants. Alder Heck. Thank you. I have a question for Rowan Davidson, if he's still on. Yes, yeah. I'm here. Thank you. So uh, you did the analysis of the existing properties and their uh, historic uh, character and components and, and contributions. And uh, I guess I'd like to talk in particularly about what I think is 410, which is, you know, there's some disagreement about whether or not this house was uh, designed by Claude and Stark and there are some neighborhood preservationists who are certain that it was, and your report uh, says that you don't believe that it was. Can you address the, uh, the differences in your findings and what uh, local uh, preservationists have found with yes. regard to the house? Yes. yes, I'd be happy to. Um, the house was built in 1907 by Emil and Ida Frauchi, a fairly prominent Madison family. It's unknown exactly who built the house for them, who designed it. The reason for this is there's no actual public record and no architectural drawings of any kind can be found as well. Um, while the building does share some similarities with the work of Claude and Stark, there really isn't any written or drawn evidence to prove that this is the case. A similar house at 831 Prospect Place, about five blocks away, was designed by Louis Claude uh, some years earlier with a similar facade. Uh, but it has a different massing and layout completely and has been altered since as well. Um, there are compiled records of all of Claude and Stark's architectural commissions, including one produced by Gordon Orr in the late 1980s, which is on file with the Department of Planning in Madison. Uh, this house is not included among those buildings. Um, the belief that it was built, that it was designed by Claude and Stark may originate with a question, actually written out Claude and Stark with a question mark, 
by Kitty Rankin, who you may know, uh, who was in the planning department and wrote this on the records that were produced in 1983. Uh, she did not actually attribute the property to Claude and Stark. Uh, she simply posited the possibility that it could have been. And I agree that in its style and its ornament, it does resemble Claude and Stark design buildings from about a decade earlier than when this one was built. But by this time in 1907, 1908, Claude and Stark were working almost entirely in a, a kind of a modified prairie uh, style, which this house certainly is not. It does not fit the other work that they were doing at the time on libraries and homes elsewhere in Madison. So without any um, concrete evidence, I could not just easily attribute it to their work. And is there a, a, a large number of, of Claude and Stark uh, designed buildings and homes that uh, are not in the register that you're talking about, the, the documentation that have... Uh, as far as I know, the work that Gordon Orr did in the 1980s documented all of the known buildings designed by Claude and Stark based on Claude and Stark's own records, drawings, contracts, and so on. Um, in Madison alone, there's about 50 some, 54, 55, um, including this other house, which I said does resemble this one, which may have been the initial clue that this was one of their designs. But I, again, repeat, there was no evidence to suggest that that is a fact. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any other questions, Alder? No. no. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any more questions of any of the registrants? I'm not seeing any raised hands. So I will close the public hearing are there questions of staff? Alder Heck. Thank you again. Uh, just a, a couple of questions, I think maybe for Mr. Parks. Um, Thanks. I, I wanted to uh, uh, see if we could uh, adapt perhaps the condition of approval that we put on the house at, uh, I think it's 935 West Johnson recently concerning a 60 day hold for demolition while appropriate uh, marketing efforts were made to uh, shop those houses for possible moving. And if we could do that for both uh, the corner house 402 and the 410 that we were just talking about, um, uh, do you have that language handy if we were to add that condition eventually? I could uh, conjure something up, I, I would imagine. And uh, I, I, because we were discussing what that effort might consist of, I'd, I'd like to just go over briefly what the language was about that particular uh, situation in terms of marketing. Sure. Uh, from 935 West Johnson Street, uh, the applicant shall market the single family residence for relocation offsite for a period of not less than 60 calendar days, starting on a date to be agreed upon by the applicant planning division. Demolition of the residence shall not be allowed within this 60 day period. Marketing of the house shall should include sharing its availability for relocation with local preservation organizations. In the event that the building is relocated, the party responsible for relocation shall coordinate with the building inspection division and city forestry office as early as possible. If the structure cannot be relo relocated, staff requests, uh, in this case, because it was a university building, that the university work with the city's preservation planner and others to document it prior to demolition. Okay, thanks, that, that's helpful. Um, I, uh, I think for now, that's all my questions.
Are there other questions of staff? Commissioner Cantrell. Could someone on staff uh, talk about uh, the, what's happening on the roof? I know there's mechanical equipment on the roof, but there's also uh, some sort of, of recreational area up there as well. And uh, is that uh, a permissible activity uh, on the roof area? Yes, uh, the zoning code doesn't count uh, occupiable uh, active roofs as a story for the purposes of uh, calculating the number of stories. So this is basically a bonus uh, story. There's allusion to it in the uh, somewhere in the staff report. Uh, but basically the, the height does not uh, include uh, uh, an occupiable uh, roof. Okay, thank you. Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, this question might be for Ms. Stouter. I'm, I'm, I'm not certain. Uh, we heard reference from public comment to the historic preservation plan and uh, goals uh, of that plan, uh, a primary goal apparently. Uh, and, and I know Alder Rummel and I both worked on that um, uh, to, to uh, undertake an effort to uh, preserve this area in particular as a, a, a an, a downtown neighborhood that has a particular character. And so I'm, I'm interested in how you feel that intersects with uh, the comprehensive plan in particular with respect to these parcels uh, and, and the goals of the historic preservation plan. Um, is it um, because that effort hasn't been undertaken uh, should we consider the historic preservation plan at all? Well, I think we can consider the historic preservation plan, but it didn't have any specific recommendations for this area yet. It's a it's a recommendation in the plan to to look at this further. Um, you know, I know we have nearby a couple blocks away. We have a very important landmark site that was one of the first. Um, you know, a black owned businesses in, in Madison, the, the Hill grocery store. That's, that's like I said, a couple blocks away on Dayton street. Um, our preservation planner didn't identify any specific properties, you know, adjacent to this proposed building that were really called out in the historic preservation plan um, related to some of the comments that we heard this evening. And so I, you know, I don't think we have a lot of guidance from that specifically um, to apply to the, the plan commission decision. You're, you're talking more about individual structures rather than the entire neighborhood uh, cataloging of neighborhoods and these things that we have and these plans that we never seem to manage to do. Um, um, uh, um, Mr. Parks does have his hand raised, so he may have something to add um, to Ms. Stouter's comments. More just a point of clarification that the historic preservation plan was adopted by the council on May 19th, about seven weeks after this application was submitted. Um, so it wasn't referenced in the, the, the staff report because at the time that uh, this proposal was submitted, it had not yet been adopted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, maybe one one more question. Uh, this might be for Mr. Parks. Uh, I, I, currently, there are two large street trees, I believe, on the east on East Washington, and in the plans, I see cute little street trees. That and so I, I just wanted to clarify what the situation was with the street trees. Are, is the plan to remove those, or is it? Uh, something that still needs to be negotiated. So regarding the four street trees on East Washington Avenue, had a conversation this afternoon 
uh, based on some questions that came up from another member of the plant commission about the, the fate of those four trees and moving from west to east along the East Washington frontage, the two closest to Hancock Street, uh, trees one and two, if you will, uh, are actually uh, slated for removal by the city forester uh, due to their condition. Uh, so regardless of whether or not the project goes forward, the two honey locust trees uh, closest to or east from uh, North Hancock Street are going to be removed regardless of the project. Otherwise, uh, Mr. Hoffman uh, pointed out in our conversation uh, that the other two trees, which would be trees three and four, uh, west to east going towards uh, Franklin, these would be the two closest to Franklin, that they would be subject to the conditions in the staff report uh, from the city forestry section uh, that address uh, the various things that uh, the forestry section will require to uh, preserve those trees during construction. Uh, and so uh, there are conditions uh, in there regarding all of the trees uh, but uh, Brad wanted to point out that otherwise those two trees closest to Hancock are unfortunately not in a condition where they can remain uh, regardless of whether the project goes ahead or not. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions of staff? Other questions of staff? Seeing no questions, I would be looking for a motion. Commissioner Cantrell. I, I am going to um, recommend that the Planning Commission find that uh, the demolition and the conditional use standards of approval can be met on this project, uh, which would allow the construction of a 10 story uh, building on the site. Do we have a second? Commissioner Sundquist. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Commissioner Cantrell, do you wish to speak to your motion? Yes, and I, I, I guess um, the the reason for the bonus stories, at least in my estimation, um, are the the setbacks which are which the development team is providing along the adjoining streets. Uh, the quality of the materials being uh, used in, in the building, and and also the the comparison of this building uh, uh, form to an eight-story building, uh, which uh, the plan uh, indicated uh, could be appropriate for the entire area uh, where this um, uh, building is is. Um, Proposed. I think that the form that they're uh, providing, adjusting, uh, uh, the moving the two stories uh, uh, to the rear, to the front, uh, which would add uh, the 10 story along uh, East Washington, uh, creates a better design. And I think urban design uh, uh, proved it based on that as well. Uh, I think this is provides a density where we want it along East Washington. I think it uh, it recognizes that uh, 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 th that it's consistent with the plan, the downtown plan, and and also uh, is um, uh, consistent with with what what we believe will happen in the future, and. Um, and although the area directly north of this may not be all developed with six story buildings, but there may be some additional development which will occur within that area. And again, that's in the future. Uh, but I do think that we need to provide density where it's appropriate 
And I think along the East Washington corridor is where we have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, services, uh, transit, BRT in the future, uh, uh, reasonable distance to the downtown and other services. Uh, I think this is an appropriate development for this site. Thank you, Mr. Cantrell, Commissioner Cantrell. Um, Alder Rummel. I didn't expect to be so quick in the queue. Um, I'm struggling with this. We're gonna have another item on the, the next agenda that doesn't have a downtown plan to protect it. It also calls for clear cutting a, 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 a neighborhood and in the name of you know, more density and, and whatever. But I think we heard a lot from the public testimony about um, how it will undermine this historic neighborhood, the fabric of which has a mix of uses and types of housing and is affordable. And we can talk about we need more housing, but if we tear it down and don't have replacement housing, we are gentrifying um, the city and, and making it so only people with money can afford to live in these buildings. And that's what we're, we're gonna approve here if you vote for this. And maybe you're saying that's not my, um, I, I, that's not in my purview. And I understand that that's what you say, but as an alder, I, I hear that it's something that, you know, just even in um, Atwood, like so many people, you know, we approve these sort of mid-market things, you know, market rate for the area, which is, you know, changes. It's not just one price. And still everyone's like, I can't find an affordable place. So that I hear all the time. There is a crisis of affordable housing and all we do is let, you know, build more luxury or high-end priced housing. And so, and, and to the point about whether we should allow the bonus story, I don't believe it meets um, 14A which says that the excess height is compatible with the existing or planned, if the recommendations in the downtown plan call for changes, character of the surrounding area, including but not limited to the scale, mass, rhythm, and setbacks of buildings and relationship to street frontages and public spaces. And we can all agree that we need more density and maybe that um, one corner building is definitely ripe for redevelopment and a modest more infill um, development and, and or if we move some of the houses but basically it's clear cutting and I personally as a person who wants to weave in older properties with newer ones that's how you build a city not just like eliminating whole things that's what we historically we've done and then we mourn the loss of those neighborhoods so I just don't believe it meets the downtown plan either I think if you look at the James Madison plan um, recommendation number five kind of talks about this area. It says, allow infill and redevelopment along Hancock, Franklin and Blair Street generally, compa generally compatible in scale and design with the predominantly house-like neighborhood character. We're not doing that. So, you know, you can read uh, different objectives and different recommendations and say different conclusions. And that's an art and a science that I've seen as an alder that everyone does when they use these adopted plans. But I just think that we should tell them it's too big and the lights, they're gonna mess up with people's light. You know, this is kind of a hill. There's just gonna be icy conditions all winter long and it's gonna be dangerous. So I don't see how that improves the quality of life for those neighbors that manage to stay there. And I, I guess I really question if this passes, you know, what it is we're telling um, the, the city uh, developers who, this is a skilled developer. He's got a great team. He could do different things, but you know, he sees opportunity to, 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 to fit what he thinks is a plan, but the plan has more than this in it. And I would like to ask developers to read deeper and try and provide more um, affordable mix of housing for our downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Commissioner Sunquist. Yeah, so I seconded this because I, and um, and um, sympathetic to Mr. Cantrell's arguments. Um, still want to listen to what others have to say. I was listening carefully to Alder Rummel on the other side. Um, so I'll just muse a little bit about where I am and where I'm, in, I'm inclined to support it and why. Um, in no particular order, the gentrification issue absolutely a 
tremendous pressing uh, public concern here. And But it cuts both ways. There's a short-term issue and a longer-term issue. And we were just in the bird glass discussion looking at San Francisco. San Francisco has probably the worst gentrification issue in the country. And largely it was because they shut the door back in the 60s and 70s on this sort of redevelopment. Um, there's just not enough housing to go around in San Francisco. So yes, this is this is um, replacing several buildings. It is adding to the housing stock. Um, I just, and I and it cuts both ways. So there's the negative that a lot of people have pointed out. There's also the uh, longer term issue. So I'm sort of weighing that as a public policy issue. The standards that we have to judge it by our consistency with the plan and then the conditional use standards and the and the height bonus story issue. Um, I do think that this is what we asked for in the downtown plan. Um, and let's just say this were a six story building. Um, Alder Rummel was talking about clear cutting. That, that the same buildings would be torn down if it was six stories. That's, I mean, that's just what we asked for in the plan. We asked for redevelopment in this, this area where it's, and so we, we kind of said to the development community, come build pretty intense stuff along this corridor and in this specific location. And that implies that the buildings that were there would be replaced. And so I'm um, not sure that get a smaller building on the site addresses the issue of um, keeping those buildings. It's, it's also, you know, we have procedures to protect historic buildings that really are contributing and important and these aren't them I mean that's those haven't they haven't been put on the list for protection um, so these are things that I'm thinking about here um, and there really is a, a tremendous benefit to the density along this corridor and close to downtown uh, we don't have that many places for development um, of, of this scale and this intensity. We really don't. It's one of the reasons that I was so adamant that we keep as much clear for development in Oscar Meyer as we can, because these places are just really few and far between. I think the one in Atwood is even gonna be coming up is gonna be even a tougher call for me, I think, um, but we'll see. Um, but it's just, um, you see what the struggle is and the trade-offs are when we try to do these infill, because it is, it, it's it's tough. The trade-offs are real, and then finally, this the the standard about the 10, 10 versus eight. Um, starting off tonight, I was inclined to think that they didn't that it didn't really address didn't meet that um, because you know something it's in the eye of the beholder now. UDC, who we rely on for these things, did think it was successful and. Um, the high quality of the materials and the design and so forth. So got to give that some weight. I think they're the people we we put that on. Um, but I I mean, I was still not thinking it was, was it really that good? But, but what we get for that extra two stories is the step back. And um, as a planner, I, I think that really helps in terms of the shadow. It helps in terms of meshing it into the neighborhood to the extent possible. Um, acknowledging that it is big for the neighborhood as it currently, you know, the neighborhood currently stands. And staff pointed out that this is a, the consistency is with future development, not current development. And that's really true. So um, on balance, I'm inclined to, to support this now, but I'll shut up and see what other people have. And maybe somebody can convince me not to. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Solheim. I'm also, I would say supportive of the proposal at this point. Um, I am of course a huge supporter of affordable housing. Um, that's, you know, kind of what I do. And I hate to see the 25 units, I think I counted them, um, that would be lost with this proposal. However, you know, with 156 new units, that's net, you know, 100, 130 new units. Um, and it's projects like this that 
that provide funding for the city to support affordable housing projects. Um, you know, the city has been really a leader. I know there's still a lot of work to be done, obviously, um, but the city has done a great job in terms of providing consistent funding over the last several years to support affordable housing projects throughout the city. And it's large projects like this. I know that this isn't in a TIPS district, but it's projects like this and developments like this that provide us with the, you know, the budget, the funds in our budget to support those proposals. Um, and, you know, in terms of the, the sizing of it, um, I'm not sure if losing a couple of stories would make it seem, you know, any less drastic next to a two story building. That's kind of the way it is for something that's the first project on the block or in that area. Um, and anything smaller would, again, just result in, in less replacement housing units. So for those reasons and a couple of others, I'm, I'm supportive of it currently, but would still like to hear from others. Thank you. Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this, I, I've obviously been involved with this uh, this proposal for quite a while. And um, it, it's another one of those situations where I think there are, there's conflicting signals from the plans. And, uh, you know, yes, zoning says eight stories plus two could go on this narrow little strip along four blocks of East Washington. And that could get two bonus stories. Uh, and then immediately behind it is a neighborhood that is uh, in the in the downtown plan could have six story structures in it. But in, that is, it came up earlier, but that is not what's going to happen to this neighborhood. Uh, this is a vibrant neighborhood of uh, a mixture of multi-flat rentals, uh, full house rentals, two housing co-ops, owner occupied, lovely little homes. Uh, and I really don't think that this neighborhood is going to change and be uh, six story tall buildings. And even beyond Mifflin Street, as you go towards Lake Monona, I mean, Mendota, four story buildings could could uh, be permitted through the downtown plan, but I also don't think that's going to happen. Currently the zoning for this block uh, just behind this downtown core area is DR1, which only allows a 60 foot wide building maximum. And uh, it's there aren't going to be many six story structures that are gonna be uh, taking up less than two of these little 33 foot wide lots that are back there. And uh, the people that live there, as you've heard, love this neighborhood. It's affordable, it's relatively diverse, and they get to enjoy some of the benefits of living downtown without living in an expensive high rise. Uh, you know, that the plan does point towards these higher buildings and the zoning does in this little narrow strip. But I really do think it's a, it's, it's a fault built into the downtown plan, but it's also a fault built into what made the downtown plan. The downtown plan was mostly designed, uh, all, most of the input came from people who own property and renters are cut out of that process. And uh, I don't know how to get around that, but this is a result of it not being an inclusive process when the downtown plan was pulled together. Uh, I think times have kind of changed. We need to figure out a way to engage other constituencies or who are impacted or we're going to exacerbate these problems. Now, is that the job of plan commission to weigh all of that or do we just look at what's in the downtown plan and say this is what it says and this is what the zoning is it's a tough choice but i do think the conditions of approval uh uh not even so much about the bonus stories but conditions of approval uh four and nine that reference uh that the, you know let 
the plan commission shall find that the project creates an environment of sustained aesthetic desirability compatible with the existing or intended character of the neighborhood, et cetera. It's saying existing or intended, and we, we've run into this in the past, and I lean towards this neighborhood is not going to change much uh, unless we build this big building, which might make this block uh, less desirable, but I, I don't think the neighborhood's gonna change that much. So I lean towards more respecting the existing neighborhood. Thanks. Thank you, Alder Heck. Commissioner Spencer. Thank you. I think um, I agree with the uh, previous commissioners, what they've said. In general, I do support the density um, as long as it fits with the downtown plan, which this does and doesn't. Um, you know, I guess I do have concerns with the bonus heights and the community benefits, the potential impact to the neighborhood. And I did have concerns about the neighborhood participation. I heard that some people didn't hear about the meeting or didn't know anything about the process. That could be because of, um, you know, there's not a neighborhood group to pipeline that into. Um, I heard about some obstacles, even participating in this meeting, not knowing where it was. So that, you know, um, causes me to have some concerns and also concerns about impact around the neighborhood, not just things like, you know, shadows, but also um, that there's a soup kitchen or a shelter next door. Is there potential for that to be, um, you know, pushed out or priced out of that neighborhood? And so, you know, like uh, Commissioner Sundquist and Solheim has stated, it's it's good density. I think it's good for the downtown, whether it's eight or 10 stories. Um, I'm more inclined to support eight stories. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Spencer. Other comments, more discussion. Commissioner Sunquist. Yeah, just briefly, cause I've said my piece, but I just wanted to thank Alder Heck. I'm still weighing this, but he made a really good case. Um, and, I, and I wanted to underscore one thing that he said is the how renters are treated in our planning process. Uh, renters and younger people, uh, more mobile people who aren't in neighborhoods for long periods, really it's it's a, an enormous challenge and, and those folks, it's true, do not get their due in our planning processes. I mean, that said, I, I still know how, you know, we, how we end up with this, but, um, uh, sure would be great to try to solve that problem because it, it underlies a lot of things that happen in our city when those interests are not served. Thank you, Commissioner. Alder Rommel. Thank you. Um, one more thing that Comp Plan talks about is how we um, have these I've identified growth priority areas, right? And we're saying these are where we want their long transit corridors and and this is where, you know, growth should happen. But, you know, all these projects that get me aggregated make me go read the comp plan. So I guess there's a positive benefit here. But if you were gonna dig into the growth priority areas on page 15 of the comp plan, it would say something to the along the lines of, um, these areas will continue to redevelop and evolve, but likely cannot absorb a majority of the city's projective growth. And we always say downtown should absorb all this growth because everyone wants to live there, but it's an older historic fabric, which is not reproducible. It's not, 
we should be focusing on like the Brayton lot. Like why is the city holding on to a surface parking lot? Why don't we move some of these houses to the freaking Brayton, Brayton lot while we wait? I mean, why can't we make that into a little neighborhood of orphan houses? But we let that sit there and we tear down the historic fabric uh, instead when we should be focusing as we always talk about these like, you know, parking lots, like, you know, in certain other parts of the city where we we're, we're skilled at that. So. Anyway, I just think that, you know, we can say we're always about, um, you know, developing downtown, but I think we should be very careful when we do it and not rip out something thinking that it's a better good. It might not be a better good. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Um, Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, I don't know where this vote is going, but I wanted to offer uh, several amendments to the motion, uh, should it be approved. Uh, and I and see if Commissioner Cantrell is amenable to these. These are things that came up earlier in discussion. I'd like to uh, offer conditions of approval uh, related to uh, the developer uh, offering lease extensions to the current residents through the end of October. I'd like to add one uh, about, uh, uh, this didn't come up in discussion, but it's kind of standard in downtown development such as this, to, for the developer to re uh, be required to provide an outdoor dog waste station and supplies. And, uh, oh, there was one other one, what was it? Uh, housing, oh, the 60 days. Uh, the 60 day uh, uh, requirement to market the potential to move the buildings as we did at 935 West Johnson as, as Mr. Parks detailed. With the agreement of the body, um, I those will be in. So if you object, raise your hand. Seeing no raised hands, those are in as part of the motion. Did you have anything else, Alder Heck? Any? Yes. If I could just say a few words, I, I was really, um, you know, persuaded by some of the comments that Alder Heck made to interject just a little bit and, and mention, you know, I, I do want the plan commission to remember the enormous effort that went into widespread engagement when we when we underwent the process for the comprehensive plan and engaging folks throughout the city, regardless of tenure. Um, we tried so hard to engage a very wide variety of folks based on race, age, geography, et cetera. And, you know, overwhelmingly in that process heard of, you know, the need for more housing in the city. We need more housing. We need more housing at all levels. We need housing that's well served by transit, well located. We want more infill than we do, um, you know, greenfield development. And I'm, I'm moved just to mention that not necessarily with this project in mind specifically, but I think we are at a crossroads. You think of the Oscar Meyer plan, you think of a lot of things that are facing plan commission and council today. And I just think it's important for the plan commission to realize that the comprehensive plan does guide our staff recommendations to a great extent. And so I, I just do want to, to mention that and to say that we are very committed to trying to involve um, a diverse set of perspectives in our planning processes, including folks who don't live in the given neighborhood. And I, I don't, I'm not saying that we did um, a fantastic job of that historically and in the downtown plan. But I just I just want to react to that. It was, it really hit me. I think it was a, a set of very important comments and I just wanted to share that. Um, thank you, Ms. Stouter. Um, I, I would say that there was a very good outreach for the comprehensive plan. And um, the um, downtown plan that was off the table um, during the time that we did our comprehensive plan. And there was not that kind of really stellar outreach when the downtown plan was done. So that that was a study in contrast. Um, and so downtown plan off the table when the comp plan was done. 
and there wasn't that kind of outreach during that. So I'm glad we're going in that direction of doing a much better outreach um, job than when the plan was put together for this particular um, area. Um, and I know that we also have on our to-do list um, to redo UDD8, I mean UDD4, um, which um, covers this area. And I think any, everybody would agree um, it is in stark contrast to the absolutely wonderful UDD8, which really helped to guide development further down on East Washington. So we've got a little bit of um, uh, contrast here on some things. So uh, anything else um, before we move to a vote? I don't see any hands. Um, so I am going to assume unanimous consent unless I see raised hands. I am seeing raised hands. Um, so I will take the raised hands as being a vote against the motion. And there are three raised hands voting against the motion. So the motion then does pass. Madam Chair, the, the motion that tonight we have eight voting members, including the chair. And so I believe we need five votes in order to pass the motion. And the chair declines to vote. Which I believe then means the motion fails. Is that correct? No, this motion would fail then, yes. Okay, okay. Um, so motion fails. Do we have another motion? Alder Rummel, your hand is up. Do you intend to? Okay. Okay. I'm looking for another motion then. Anybody willing to make a motion? I see a lot of no's. So in that case, uh, Ms. Stouter, what's the uh, next step? Well, I think, I mean, I think the, the best case forward now, if, if there isn't a motion that will pass the uh, proposal, we'll, we'll need a motion in order to place this on file. And so what I would expect is that someone who voted against it would make that motion to instead place this on file and decide whether to place it on file without prejudice or to place it on file, period. And I can explain that distinction if anybody needs. I, I, think, I think all members know what the difference is on that. Alder Heck. I'll make a motion to place this on file without prejudice. And is there a second? Seconded by Alder Rummel. Do you wish to speak to your motion, Alder Heck? Yes. Um, I, you know, I, I understand the discussion about the likelihood that something is going here and uh, it's likely that this of East Washington will uh, does have the potential to provide something positive to the city. Um, I, I would like to recognize 
what what our chair just said recently about Urban Design District 4 and and what came up in the past about the comparison to further down East Washington. Uh, This is a really tough fit. And uh, if there was kind of uh, more guidelines from UDD4 to help with the transition to the existing neighborhood, I think something can work here. And I think something from this development team could potentially even work there if there was just a better transition to the neighborhood. I don't, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean 10 stories and, uh, you know, I I don't know. It's just something that's a more gradual transition that may mean less height. So that's why I'm I'm recommending uh, to place it on file without prejudice. Thank you. Mr. Parks, did you have something to add? Yes, if the plan commission is inclined to place the item on file without prejudice, they need to find that one or more standards for conditional use and or demolition permit approval are not met, uh, enumerating the standards that they're finding not met. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I would reference uh, approve, conditional use approval standards four and nine in particular, as well as uh, 14A concerning uh, additional height as not being met. Those are all related to how it interacts with the neighborhood, essentially. Thank you. Any further discussion on this motion? Commissioner Cantrell. I would just like to, um, I guess, give the development team a little guidance that I'm certainly not in favor of an entire eight story building on this section of the block that they showed us because I think that's that would be very detrimental. Um, uh, it looks like a box, it doesn't relate. If, if the other project didn't relate to the neighborhood, that certainly would not as well. Uh, so uh, at least a, a recognition of a step down uh, to, the, to the neighborhood uh, to the north, I think is very important. And also the setbacks, which uh, they provided along uh, East Washington and the side streets, Hancock and, um, and um, Franklin, Franklin. I, th- I think was important as well. So that would be at least some direction, at least from this plan commissioner, that that um, uh, that a different plan, uh, they have to, uh, incorporate some of the things that they did with this design. Thank you, Commissioner Cantrell. Commissioner Hagenow. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm just going to kind of second what uh, Commissioner Cantrell kind of added there. Um, you know, this this one was a tough one for me as well. I, I, I yeah, I just wasn't swayed enough to believe that this uh, development fits fits into the neighborhood appropriately, um, no matter what the you know the downtown plan says, comp plan. I, it, these ones that have so so much opportunity, I guess, for people to make valid arguments on either way, uh, are just really. I mean, we we just kind of kick ourselves in the in the rear end a little bit here when we when we set ourselves up for these so um you know i i think if the developer the development team can come back with um something something that has some setbacks that blends into the neighborhood that feels like it fits a little bit better uh it, it's going to be a lot closer thank you thank you commissioner 
Commissioner Solheim. I just wanted to say that I agree with the, the comments about preferring a building that steps down rather than a block. And I also um, really liked the change in materials in the, the portion of the, the building that was in the back. It made it seem like more of a varied facade that could fit in a little bit better than all one kind of color. So that's something that I would like to see personally in future iterations. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the... Um, additional comments from commissioners that um, hopefully will be helpful to the development team. Anything else? Okay, then I will assume unanimous consent on this motion unless uh, there are raised hands to object. Seeing no raised hands, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to the next item on our agenda. Um, agenda item nine, Legistar 60477, located at 1937 through 1949 Winnebago Street and 316 Russell Street, 6th Alder District. Consideration of a demolition permit to demolish four commercial buildings and a single family residence. Consideration of a conditional use in the traditional shopping street district for a building exceeding 25,000 square feet of floor area for a mixed use or multi-tenant building in consideration of a conditional use in the TSS district to allow construction of a building taller than three stories and 40 feet to allow construction of a four-story mixed-use building with approximately 12,000 square feet of commercial space and 13 apartments. And we do have a staff uh, presentation by uh, Colin Punt. Mr. Punt. All right. Uh, Thank you, Chair Zellers. Uh, the next request you have before you uh, is for demolition permits for four commercial buildings on Winnebago Street and a single family residence around the corner on Russell Street, uh, as well as the necessary conditional uses to build a four story mixed use building uh, with approximately 12,000 square feet of commercial space, commercial and office space uh, on the first and the second floors, uh, as well as 13 apartments on the third and fourth floors. Uh, plus underground and some surface parking. Uh, staff highlights uh, conditional use approval standards uh, 4, 9, and 12 as they relate to building height and design, uh, and also standard 5 as it relates to uh, parking and uh, potential traffic impacts. Um, staff does believe that with the uh, conditions suggested by reviewing agencies, uh, the Planning Commission can find the uh, standards met. Uh, and as always, I'm available to answer questions uh, when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Punt. And we will go to the public hearing. And our first registrant, hold on just a second here. Our first registrant is Fritz Hastreiter, opposed and wishing to speak, 1933 Winnebago Street, Madison. Uh, the next speaker is afterwards is Charlie Luthen. So Mr. Hastreiter. Hello? Yes. I am the... Uh at 1933 Winnebago Street. I am the owner and resident for 30 years. I am opposed to the project in its present form. Zoning code section 28.183 states that there are 16 conditions that need to be met and the shared driveway does not meet those standards. Um, they actually make it worse. So the first one is the health, safety, and welfare. Uh, fifth one, access road parking supply. Number six, adequate ingress and egress. 10 is parking reduced, other parking. 
The shared right of way was created in 1901, the horse and buggy days. Soon afterward, 316 Russell Street was parceled off, taking the driveway right away with it. For the 30 years I have been on Winnebago Street, there has been no connection between 1937 to 49 Winnebago Street and the shared driveway. There is a parking lot behind 1937 to 49 Winnebago and it is fenced in. The obvious user of the shared driveway is the house. All other users should have a say in, in changing the use from three houses, which is five units and a small restaurant. The large multi-use building proposed is a radical change from the existing use, traffic and ingress, egress. 320 Russell has a door within five feet of the driveway and the new proposed entrance to the underground parking would have vehicles brushing near the door. This is not a safe situation and new construction would not allow it. Three adults and a child use that door. Drivers have been seen goosing the engine, exiting the driveway or entering. The driveway is not just a road for vehicles, it is also a sidewalk. It is unique for this purpose. The three houses have used it as a sidewalk and the Mint Mark uses it to get the 16 trash recycling containers out to Russell Street. Normally I am around in gardening, turning 70 soon, and I recognize friends that are passing through and people that shouldn't be trespassing. I don't notice all damages, but there are a couple of dings in the ex expensive garage door, occasional missing items, and seeing strangers from a distance. We can tolerate some of the infractions. The new development at four stories and the park- hey, Thank you, Mr. Hastrider. Your time has expired. Um, our next registrant is Charlie Luthen, opposed, wishing to speak. And to remind speakers, uh, there is a three minute limit on uh, speaking. So Mr. Luthen to be followed by Terry Cohn. Mr. Luthen. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Charlie Luthen. I own the property at 321 Russell. Uh, across the street from this proposed development, I've owned it since 1998. Uh, Fritz, my neighbor, um, had some good points. I'd like to amplify that a little bit, but before I do, I want to mention that a colleague of mine, Jim Rogers, uh, is on the phone and he would like to speak. His telephone number ends in 77. Um, I'm opposed to the commission issuing conditional use for this project as it is really ill-designed for this location. I'm actually a little surprised that staff says that they have met all conditions because I disagree with that uh, completely. I liken this project to putting a size eight foot into a size 11 shoe. Sorry, the other way around, a size 11 foot into a size eight shoe. Um, this development is way too big for the footprint that's available to it. There are at least six of 15 conditions from your zoning code section 281836A approval standards that will not be met. Condition one, um, the use will not be detrimental to or endanger public health safety and general welfare. Well, the anticipated increase in traffic on this cul-de-sac will endanger resident and visitor safety. Secondly, condition three states uses, values, and enjoyment of other property in the neighborhood for purposes already established will not be substantially impaired or diminished. Both the increase in traffic, parking pressure, overall congestion, and a four-story building looming over the neighborhood will impair the current uses, values, and enjoyment of residents on our block. Condition five states adequate access roads, parking supply, internal circulation movements have been provided. The proposed new parking and current area and current area parking are entirely inadequate for this development and internal street circulation will be compromised. 
Condition six, must provide adequate ingress and egress to minimize traffic congestion and to ensure public safety and adequate traffic flow. Both on site and on the public streets, there is inadequate ingress egress planned at this site. Condition nine, the project creates an environment of sustained aesthetic desirability compatible with the existing character of the area. Every comment I have seen and heard from residents of the neighborhood is that this is not a project of aesthetic desirability. And in fact, it would greatly diminish the character and historic nature of the neighborhood. And finally, condition 12, for an application for height in excess of that allowed, the condition- Thank you, Mr. Luthen, your time has expired. Um, our next uh, registrant is Terry Cohn. Linden Avenue, Madison opposed and wishing to speak to be followed by Mark Jorgensen. Mr. Cohn. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. My name oh, is Terry sorry. Cohn. That's okay. <laughs> I'm speaking in opposition to the demolition of these buildings that M&M own and the four story apartment business development they are proposing for three major reasons. We have lived on Linden Avenue, which is four blocks away, and we will be directly affected by it. We have lived in our home for 42 years. We have watched a dying neighborhood become revitalized with successful businesses and houses that have been restored and now quite desirable. We have absorbed many apartments and condos and they continue as the one on Atwood across from Monona Bank is just being completed and not yet filled with tenants. There have been the consistent excuse from the developer that to do anything less than four stories is not worth it. And as a result, the area around Shanks Corners and along Atwood has become a canyon. And all of this has exacerbated three major problems. The first is parking. As each new development is erected, the developer has assured the neighborhood that there will be adequate parking, assuming either one car per unit or that those who live there will be using public transportation. The parking issues have been impossible and real over the years when wanting to have social events on Linden Avenue, as people have had to park at least four blocks away. This is due to restaurants, the Barrymore, live venues, and the increased number of people living in the units who need to park one of their vehicles on the street or also choose to entertain and their guests take up parking places. A large office space will mean cars will be parked most of the day as close to the building as they can be. This will place a burden on the parking available to other businesses and residents in the area, and many of our homes do not have garages. The second is traffic problems. The corner where Winnebago and Atwood intersect is a difficult corner for both cars and pedestrians during the morning and late afternoon commute. Cars in the morning approach the corner going west very fast to make the light and also to avoid the bus stop that is right at that corner. As they speed around the corner, it creates what is already a difficult situation, getting out of Russell onto Winnebago. This will only be worsened by tenants attempting to get onto Winnebago from Russell and those wanting to turn left onto Russell. The pedestrian situation has been attempted to be be made safer by an all walk crossing light, but it's still difficult to get to the bus stop when cars are flying, trying to turn left onto Winnebago or to continue west on Winnebago, speeding to make through what is already a red light. The third problem is M&M's properties. The properties that they own on Atwin and Winnebago have been allowed to deteriorate and problems have either been not addressed or fixed in a shoddy, cheap manner. As a result, their tenants have had to move. As owners of structures that make up the character of our neighborhood, they waited until they believed they were too ill of repair and not worth their investing in the upkeep. Those of us who own 100 year old homes in the neighborhood are required to keep them up. Why do these property owners who have not been good landlords or neighbors deserve to demolish some of the last buildings with character in our neighborhood and erect a building that does not fit in the space, has not provided green space in the proposal and does not have enough parking for thank, both. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Cohen, your time is up. Um, moving on to Mark Jorgensen, 1947 Winnebago Street, Madison, in support and wishing to speak to be followed by Greg Held. Mr. Jorgensen. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Jorgensen and I have worked in the Atwood neighborhood for over 20 years as part of Eminem Real Estate Investments, who has been in the Atwood neighborhood for over 30 years. In 2004, um, we developed Shanks Point condominium on the other end of 
Atwood at, on Atwood and Division Street. Our office is presently on Winnebago Street in one of the buildings um, that is listed for demolition. We have owned and leased most of these spaces since 1994, with one purchased as recently as 2013. The five properties listed for demolition have been maintained and leased with few vacancies for the most of the last 25 years. They were all fully leased at the time of the submittal. Uh, just recently, the tenants have begun to move out. Currently, we are working on a, with a client in the service industry who would like to be in the Natwood, Atwood neighborhood, but needs a larger space than we can provide with the existing smaller footprint buildings. This project, uh, proposed project, will allow that opportunity to provide space for that business as well as additional retail and residential mixed use components. Thank you for considering this project. Thank you, Mr. Jorgensen. Uh, the next registrant is Greg Held, 7601 University Avenue, Middleton in support, wishing to speak, uh, representing M&M Real Estate Development to be followed by Ronald Class. Mr. Held. I'm sorry, I was muted, I didn't realize it. Um, I have a presentation to go through. Okay, thank you. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes. Okay. First, I'd like to give a quick thank you to the planning staff for their detailed report and Alder Rummel for facil facilitating meetings with the Neighborhood Planning Committee and the neighborhood at large. I'll move through this as quickly as I can and then I'll be available to answer questions at the end. The site is located at the intersection of Winnebago and Russell Streets. The site is currently zoned TSS, traditional shopping street, as is the entire block. The comprehensive plan recommends neighborhood mixed use for this site. Neighborhood mixed use specifies residential densities up to 70 units per acre and buildings up to four stories in height. We're proposing a four story mixed use building. The first floor will have just under 5,000 square feet of commercial space. The second floor has about 7,800 square feet of office space and the third and fourth floor have a total of 13 dwelling units. At our initial meeting with the planning and development committee of the neighborhood, the project was well received. We were given some suggestions for improvement which we incorporated into the design prior to an online meeting with the neighborhood at large. Following the neighborhood meeting, Mark met with the owners of all the adjacent properties to discuss their concerns. At each of these points of contacts with the neighborhood, we listened to concerns and where we could, we incorporated this feedback into the design. Next image. This is the existing conditions on the site. The site is currently occupied by one and two story commercial buildings fronting on Winnebago Street and a two-story house on Russell Street. There's approximately 3,500 square feet of commercial retail space and two dwelling units on the site. The combined site has eight parking stalls. We are requesting approval to demolish the existing buildings as part of the redevelopment. At its May 4th meeting, the Landmarks Commission found that while the buildings contribute to the vernacular context of Madison's built environment, the buildings themselves are not historically significant. Next image. Our site plan overlaid on the aerial photo to show a relationship to the adjacent properties. One of the concerns brought forward by the neighbors was the uh, shading of their properties from the four-story building. We prepared a short shadow study animation to show the impact of the sh uh, shadows on the adjacent properties. Can you run that, Colin? Colin, do you have the shadow study animation? The study was using, done using April 19th as a date for the sun's path. Since our building is located north of the adjacent properties, we selected this date approximately one month after the vernal equinox to show the resultant shadows as the sun's path moves northward in the sky. There would of course be a corresponding date in the fall where the sun takes the same path. 
With our building located essentially due north of the nearest buildings, the shadowing impact on adjacent properties is minimal. Could you go back to the image then? The um, your, time, your time has elapsed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next registrant is Ronald Class in support, wishing to speak uh, from 7530 Westward Way, Madison. Um, and he is representing Mark Jorgensen of 1947 Winnebago Street, who we heard from a few uh, speakers ago. Mr. Class to be followed by Jim Rogers. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. We are doing the civil engineering and land surveying for this project. And tonight I'd like to address the stormwater management. This project was submitted under the old stormwater ordinance for stormwater management. However, it will meet most of the requirements of the newly adopted ordinance for redevelopment. First, the peak runoff will be reduced by storing rainfall on the roof. Secondly, runoff volume will be reduced by incorporating green infrastructure as part of the rooftop patio areas. Third, sediment will be reduced by incorporating uh, underground parking and thus having less surface pavement. Uh, currently, there is no collection of stormwater on the site. So it just uh, runs over the sidewalk and into the street. With this project, stormwater will be stored on the roof and then routed via piping to the existing storm sewer on Winnebago, thereby reducing the impacts of, uh, of stormwater in the neighborhood. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Class. Um, the next registrant is Jim Rogers, 321 Russell Street, Madison, opposing and wishing to speak to be followed by Laura Brunner. Mr. Rogers. This is Jim Rogers and can you hear me? I live on Russell Street across from the Russell Street house that is proposed to be torn down in the proposed development. Thank you for your late night work listening to the neighborhood affected by this proposed development. If changes cannot be made, reducing the approved plan to meet the three-story neighborhood standard, I recommend this proposal not be approved. I'd like to em emphasize three points, safety, building shadow and parking on my longer July 6th letter from the perspective of a resident living on the street. The first point is related to 28.183 conditional use 6A endangering public health safety. Thus this four story proposed proposal significantly decreases safety, which will be caused by the increased traffic flow. With the entirely newly added entrance being moved onto Russell Street versus being on Winnebago, exiting left from Russell onto Winnebago increases the need to dart between traffic, which flows from and to the Winnebago and Atwood Avenue intersection lights. Second point is related to zoning code section 28.183 standards and paragraph three and 12, enjoyment of property and shadows in view. Being in the shadow of a four story building blocks the evening sun by an estimation of 30 minutes and sends an evening shadow over much of the 300 block of Russell Street. This eliminates the possibility of sitting out on the porch during workday summer nights and enjoying an evening of sun hitting the porches, yards and flowers. Uh, this four-story building's evening shadow diminishes current enjoyment along with diminishing light for the growth of currently established gardens and plants. With the elimination of the house on Russell Street with a tall building being built and fully visible as part of a significant new view of Russell Street houses, this reduces the enjoyable feeling of this being a residential street where many people know faces and greet each other and switches to more of a feeling of a diminishing residential residential street adjacent to a four-story building. Third and final point is 28.183 paragraph 10 off-street parking. 
The four-story proposal will further increase parking demand on the neighborhood due to only one vehicle allowed per two bedroom units, plus the customers and employees. And I suggest in the future, street parking will need to be eliminated to allow trucks to make the large sufficient turn. I urge if some version of this proposal progresses that our neighborhood desire for it to be no more than three stories be followed with an exception to the three-story neighborhood standard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, the next registrant is Laura Brunner, 320 Russell Street, Madison, opposed and wishing to speak. Ms. Brunner. Hi, um, I just have a reiterations of what's already been said um, on section 28.071, um, just about the no negative impacts on the view shed. Um, I live at 320 Russell Street that's directly adjacent to the house to be demolished. Um, we have a fence line that goes along there. That's what I look at. What they said about the um, nowhere for stormwater to go in the existing space that it's just a paved lot, that's not true. There's a beautiful mature tree filled backyard at the house that's slated to be demolished. Um, and I, I don't think that it has been met to get rid of those trees and this view. It's not worth it for the four stories. If it was three stories, I would feel differently. Um, I'm also concerned about the rewarding of landlords that let their properties go into despair. Megan's framing literally fell into the sidewalk um, and, and giving a reward of this gigantic, um, un, too large for the footprint place, um, just doesn't sit easy with me considering that this will back up to my front door. Um, thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Ms. Bronner. Okay, that is, um, concludes the people who wanted to speak. We have one more registrant not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Donna Peckett from 1957 Winnebago Street, Madison, opposed, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Representing Donna, representing Tappet New Works Ensemble Theater, um, which is located at 1957 Winnebago Street. Um, then we Chair, have- we have, we have one more wishing to speak that came in at about 9.45. And uh, could you read that person sure. into the record, please? Sure. It, uh, it's uh, David Schmeeding, 311 Russell Street, Madison, Wisconsin. Opposed, wishing to speak? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there, my name is David Schmeeding. I'm uh, an immediate neighbor of the uh, house on Russell Street proposed for demolition. Of course, I'd ask that we might uh, consider delaying this till in-person meetings resume, but moving on. <clears throat> the uh, uh, single family home uh, is the entrance to our enclave uh, and should be zoned to reflect that. In fact, uh, if it's not going to be, uh, then the uh, development should have to honor the same uh, home setbacks. <clears throat> Regardless of that, uh, this is the only adjacent enclave to Shanks Corner the cul-de-sac ending at Eastwood and the Marquette neighborhood. I have general concerns with the scope and scale of the proposal as this singular monolithic building will overlook our entire neighborhood and overshadow immediate neighbors. Uh, <clears throat> I would request that the commission preclude underground parking. The uh, current proposal would uh, demand some kind of traffic study. I was surprised to hear that uh, any civil engineers have looked at this. Uh, as the end of this block of Russell Street, uh, where the current proposal resides, serves as at least half of the parking, sorry, uh, serves at least half of the parking of the adjacent Shanks Corners businesses. Uh, this is apparent in the uh, disrepair from the uh, driveway until Winnebago. As you heard earlier, it uh, also serves as an alley for uh, mid block, and there's just no way that uh, this is going to be safe and sustainable uh, traffic wise. Uh, this is all happening during a period of virtual meetings and while, uh, and while businesses also reevaluate the concept of office space, I'm uh, happy to hear that the uh, office space floor or the description of it has been changed a bit. These are uh, very large apartments proposed as well. 
Uh, main thing is uh, that house shouldn't really be part of a monolithic building. It should really be zoned to stay a house. Underground parking has no place in this neighborhood, uh, especially on uh, Russell or Winnebago, which cannot sustain it. I mean, it's just silly. If you came down here, you'd be able to tell that in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schmieding. Um, okay, that concludes then our uh, speakers um, and the registrant available to answer questions. We do have seven more registrants opposed and one in support, but not none of those um, wish to speak, uh, nor are they available to answer questions. Are there questions of any of our registrants? Alder Rummel. Thank you. I would like to hear from both Mr. Hofstrader and maybe Mr. Held or Mr. Jorgensen to explain more about the shared driveway right away so we know, understand from each of your point of view what's proposed and what exists, et cetera. Okay, Mr. Hofstrader. Hello. Yes. Um, so as far as the shared driveway, I mean, Mark is taking the opinion that he could just increase the use of the driveway considerably. And it's always been this quiet, uh, walk, walkable place. And, and now there's gonna be all of these vehicles parking in the basement. There will probably be vehicles that think they can access and they'll turn around and all these things. So um, I, I, I just don't see it as reasonable or that much of an increase in the driveway without having all the rest of us agree to the increase. And so Currently, some of it now is where the house is and belongs to that property. And then some of it is an easement for you and other neighbors, several neighbors. Uh, well, the half of the driveway is is Mark's house that they own, m and m house. And then uh, across the way is um, Peter Joyce's house. And then I own the whole, both halves of the right of way and, and the Mint Mark restaurant owns one foot of the right of way. Sounds complicated. Okay. But it's a private agreement. Is that correct? Yes. It's, it's, it's a private easement. It is not public. Okay. Thanks. And then looks like Greg put up the So Greg, is there a, an effort then to renegotiate the easement? Is that part of what you you would have to do to make this come to life if it were approved? Okay, I can, I'm unmuted now. Um, so the, the easement, if you look at that note on the lower left-hand side of the site plan, 12 foot right, right of way document, um, that, easement is six feet onto Mark Jorgensen's property and six feet onto Peter Joyce's property for the entire length of uh, the site that we're combining here. Um, we are only using about four feet um, because the entire easement on the east side, the bottom part of the sheet isn't paved. We're really only using uh, about four feet onto Peter Joyce's property for our drive aisle. Um, and as I think we mentioned at the neighborhood meeting, you know, any kind of improvement that needs to be done to make this happen, I think is, is certainly a point in negotiation if that needs to get repaved uh, to clean it up so that it's usable for everybody. But um, really only using part of the easement on Peter Joyce's property and Mark is a party of that easement by owning the property that it's on. Okay, that's, I guess what I got from now. Um, 
It, oh. it is true that it's a very old easement. Um, we asked our surveyor to analyze it. He thought we were within our rights to use the easement as we were intending to do. Um, that's as far as we went with it. Okay. So can you tell us um, what studies you did of the condition of all the buildings that you proposed to demolish? I would say that Mark, I'll, I'll start with this, Mark can fill in where necessary. We did have that condition where um, part of the parapet of one of the buildings on Winnebago Street collapsed earlier this spring. And he had a mason come out and take a look at it. And the reason was that the masonry ties that tied the, the face brick back to the structure behind it had just deteriorated over time um, and, and allowed that to detach from the structural backup behind it. It wasn't that there was any, you know, it was it was a hidden defect that was going on probably for years, probably before m, &M owned the properties. It wasn't something that you could tell was happening. Um, in discussions with Mark, I know that they have um, maintained the buildings, they've repaired leaks when leaks need to be repaired. They put a new roof on the, the building on the corner when they acquired it. It wasn't like they were planning uh, all along to redevelop this site. In fact, we had discussed a different site before this even came along. Um, it just, that, that fell through for other reasons, but um, I, I know that there was no intention to just let these buildings deteriorate. And the fact that he was able to keep them fully leased over the ownership uh, that they had these buildings, I think is a testament to that. It wasn't like you're just letting them go vacant and, and fall apart. Um, and so I don't know if there's anything Mark wants to add to that. Well, I'm just wondering, you know, about the um, the condition of like the house or just the basic, um, did you do a, a condition report for all the properties as part of your due diligence or did Mark do that, Mr. Jorgensen? I, I can't, I cannot speak to us. We did not hire an architectural consultant. We didn't, I guess we didn't feel that the house or the um, the commercial buildings after, we, especially after we got the landmarks commission um, recommendation, the middle of the road recommendation that, you know, we regret the loss, but not historic. Um, I guess we didn't further pursue that. Okay, thank you. Did you have any other questions, Alder? Um, not at this moment, thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cantrell. Yes, I, I still have questions on that easement, that joint easement. And what does the um, easement access on that adjoining property? Uh, is there a garage or is there a parking area? Um, Am I unmuted? I can never tell. Yes. Okay, uh, Colin, can you put up uh, image number three from our presentation? Uh, back to, okay. So, and, and, and I, you know, Fritz can speak to this too if he wants to, but um, the, so the easement, you, you can see um, below Fritz's garage, his existing garage to the left of our building, he's got a driveway and you can see that um, strip of on our our color up you can see a light gray strip of driveway going through there that's basically the width of the driveway as it exists now for the entire distance and it is accessing Fritz's property and his his garage and it also I believe serves mint mark could you point out the garage again that you're speaking to right there okay and that's the garage of the house that the, your project adjoins? Yes. Oh. Wait, um, what, um, I don't, I think uh, Greg is talking about the house that M&M owns on the side of the driveway, and not, not my garage. I, I guess I was just mentioning that the, the easement serves your house and the mint mark, and in addition to the house that M&M owns. And where is the, the, the 
the individual that lives in the house's garage, does he have one? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. The, the, the well, the adjoining that house that 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 the the other the speaker that was just on, uh, does he have a garage that that at, that uses this uh, joint easement? Yes, it's it's the one that Colin was uh, circling with the cursor a moment ago, right there. Okay, and his house again is directly um, directly above on Winnebago. Oh, okay. Uh, whose house is the one uh, directly towards Russell? Uh, the one, that one is owned by Peter Joyce. Okay. Okay. And what does that easement access for his, his uh, property? Uh, I believe they have a, a parking stall off of that easement. Okay. Okay. I guess that's all the questions I have at this time. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions of any of the registrants? Any other questions of any of the registrants before I close the public hearing? Seeing no raised hands, I will close the public hearing and are there questions for staff? Commissioner Solheim. I had two questions, um, probably for Colin. So the staff report mentions that a zoning, uh, a parking reduction of up to 20 spaces can be approved by the zoning administrator. Is that the 20 spaces amount, is it set at actually 20 in the ordinance or is that based on you know, kind of a percentage of um, required or is it actually 20? Uh, do you want to raise your hand, Colin? Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, Mr. Punt. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so there are, uh, there are kind of several different levels um, of parking reductions that can occur. Um, and there, there is a parking reduction of up to 20 stalls that can be administratively uh, approved by the zoning, uh, the, or by the, the zoning director. Um, so the the way that that typically works is that the uh, zoning reviewer will include that as a uh, as a condition of approval. There's just a very simple um, uh, application that the applicant would then have to do uh, as a condition of approval, um, mm -hmm. and then the the zoning administrator would would review that. But yes, there is a uh, a limit of up to twenty stalls that he can approve uh, beyond that, then we get into conditional uses. Um, so I, th I, I believe this was 19 or 20 stalls. So it, it was, it did fit uh, under the conditional use threshold uh, in the realm of that administrative approval. Okay. I mean, I, I think that that process makes sense, but 20 stalls seems like a very large reduction when you're starting with 25 stalls provided. Um, that makes a lot bigger, you know, a larger difference than if you're starting with 100 stalls and asking for a reduction of 20. Um, my other question, I don't know if it would be possible to bring up the floor plan, specifically the third floor plan. Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Give me one moment. Is this what you're looking Thank for? You. Yes. yes. I mean, I don't always look at these and 
in detail, but this one stuck out to me in terms of that one bedroom plus den that's in the middle and kind of shoehorned. Um, am I looking at that correctly, that there's only one, I think maybe balcony door as in terms of a exterior opening? There's no other windows or anything? That, that's what it appears like that's to what me. It, let's see, okay. All right, that is, that is um, all that I have right now, thank you. Alder Rummel. Thank you. I, I would like to follow up on that parking reduction question because it strikes me that we heard um, somebody say, oh, Mr. Jorgensen, that he had a service industry client. I don't know if that's a restaurant or if that's a, you know, maybe it's food fights moving back to the neighborhood from Monona Drive. I mean, I could imagine that could be a, one answer. So I, I know we're done with the public hearing, but if it seems to me if it were a restaurant, you wouldn't want to reduce parking because we've already lost a lot of parking with other developments. So at some point, you know, if it's a restaurant use, I don't know that there would be enough parking with a reduction. And so maybe staff can talk about how, how that works. Yeah, so um, the, the way that the parking the way that the applicant looked at the parking and the and zoning is is reviewing the parking um, is that the, without a without a use uh, provided um, like a a restaurant uh, zoning treats the the first floor commercial space um, as what it believes it would be intended for, which I, th I think it treated it as uh, retail space, office space for the second floor and uses the um, the required parking minimums in the zoning code to determine uh, what that, what the minimum number of stalls is required. Um, the unadjusted minimum required for the retail on the first floor office on the second floor and the 13 uh, apartment units um, is 44 stalls. There is also a provision in the code uh, that allows applicants to use a, a shared parking formula, which is outlined in the code um, to, uh, to share uses that, or to share stalls for uses that may not all be using them at the same times during the day. Um, using, using that, um, the requirement was then goes down to 38 stalls uh, because some of those stalls can be shared um, by by uses that aren't using them at the same time. And then from that 38, uh, they they are requesting that administrative uh, reduction of up to 20 stalls. Um, I guess it is uh, technically 13 stalls uh, because they are they are including 25 stalls. Um, so they have the the 44 that's determined by the minimum uh, parking standards, uh, the 38 that is determined by the shared parking formula, and then they are asking for the reduction down to 25 stalls. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I know, kind of I know the answer because every time it gets asked, we kind of hear, well, there, nobody hears from traffic engineering because they don't think it's a problem, but nothing's ever a problem to traffic engineering. They think every little small increment of growth is just fine. I get that. I've been around. But this is a really tricky corner. Um, I don't have to come out of it all the time. And I'm really glad when I do, I'm turning right. But if you're turning left or if it's rush hour, it's a really hard, um, it's, a, it's a tricky, I mean, not impossible, but tricky. So did staff look at that and have any, was there any kind of conclusions in their report that I might have just overlooked um i i know that they traffic engineering did include a you know kind of a somewhat standard uh condition that the developer does have to make a deposit for um the for the potential for future uh signals um signage improvements to that intersection uh, but i do not believe that they identified any uh improvements that would be needed I mean, so immediately close, subsequent to this. So close to a major intersection, you can't imagine they would uh, allow any kind of um, signalized, but 
you never know with street reconstruction, I guess mm -hmm. we can see, but okay. I if I could just interject on that, I, I think it's a matter of scale. I mean, here is a, you know, it's a four story building, but it's a, a relatively small floor plate. 13 total units and, you know, office space and some retail. I, I think that if this were a much larger project, traffic engineering probably would have had, um, you know, more more flags raised and, and more interest in, in exploring the impacts of that traffic. Right. Like I said, they often don't seem to be worried, whereas neighbors usually are worried. So I'm just trying to, trying to dig into that. Um, the other question is, I, so, uh, I was talking to um, a neighbor about a different project before Landmarks um, last night, and she had looked at this project as she looks at a lot of things and noticed that the houses on Russell Street are all TSS. Is I mean, is there a reason we never kind of flag that to make it not TSS, to make it more of a to down zone it somewhat? You know, my, my memory is not perfect on this, but I recall that this area has been planned in the comprehensive plan for neighborhood mixed use for a long time, not just in the most recent version of the comprehensive plan, but even in the 2006 plan. Uh, <clears throat> I believe that this area was um, shown as the future land use recommendation was for, for mixed use. And so I think that's just, it's reflecting the proposed future land use. It's a, it's a zoning district that, that matches that proposed future land use. So we really think that we're gonna take these, you know, 100 year old houses and eventually just let them get torn down because the future land use says something up to four, three or four stories is what we think should go here. Is that the message we're sending with the future land use and the zoning? Uh, I mean, I just say that this area had a, a a lot of attention and scrutiny during the conference of plan process. Because right. um, we pushed it down, it was, high, it was CMU before, wasn't it? Or some higher level uh, in you all that were serving then? Portions of this area and, and areas to the north were CMU and, and that it was definitely changed to the NMU during that conference of plan process. Right, everyone appreciated that. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing I just wanted to raise is you know, the Landmarks Commission, you know, okay, so I represent historic districts, as you know, if this were a historic district, they would have given you a different recommendation about the disposability of these properties. They would have said, you know, I bet 19, oh, the corner one, 1937, is that the right one? 19... Um, uh, 49, I believe is the... 37, which 47. was the corner one that had the modern talisman they probably say, oh, that might be worth saving or something different, but because it's not protected in any way, um, you know, Landmarks just sort of gives that sort of middle of the road as somebody as Colin pointed out. And so I, I'm, I'm wondering if my colleagues saw a, a late arrival email that Heather sent out, that Ms. Dowder sent to us from Jason Tish. I just wanna point that out. You came in your inboxes if you didn't see it. And, um, Something when I was talking to Ms. Bailey, and I know I'm not asking a question, but maybe I'll get to one. Um, our historic preservation planner, she said to me, sort of off the cuff, you know, this Shanks Corners is eligible to be a historic district. It's a, uh, it's kind of more or less intact histor um, commercial node that has a lot of history. And when I think about it that way, I just wonder, do we look at, as, as staff, do you look at things like, well, the, not the future land use, but the future like historic preservation use of this area. I mean, do we ever look at those kind of questions when you review things? I mean, we sure do. Um, in fact, the, the preservation preservation planner really specializes in that. And, and that is one reason that the Landmarks Commission weighs in on these things as well. Um, we discussed it this morning and um, with, with Heather Bailey, the preservation planner and um, her recollection of the conversation with you was that she identified the the actual Shanks Corners a little bit to the north of this as an area that held a lot of potential for further exploration, but that she had indicated that this area here um, did not. And so that was that was what we discussed as a staff team just this morning. She told me that it had lived through tough love um, and it wouldn't stand alone, but I don't think that 
I think that she's maybe saw the value of at least one of those buildings. And we did joke about Mediter Mediterranean revival, but I'm now, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really digressing. Anyway, so um, I am done trying to ask questions with I, as I try to share information. Um, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Are there any more questions of staff? Are there any more questions of staff? I'm not seeing any raised hands. So I would be looking for a motion. We need a motion. Commissioners, we need a motion. <laughs> Alder Rummel, you're muted. You've got to unmute yourself. Thank you. I'm not sure I'm the right person to make the motion and I'm not sure the motion I want to make, but I'll just, I'll go to the extreme and just to place it on file without prejudice based on the fact that it does not meet standards um, number nine for the aesthetic desirability and it doesn't meet the statement of purpose for demolition and it doesn't meet 2A under the demolition standards, which talks about um, the neighborhood character. Um, do we have a second? Is there a... Um, Commissioner Hagenau. Second the motion. Thank you. Um, Alder Rummel, did you wish to speak more to your motion? I, I would. I, I, I know we don't like to do this and I, I feel a little awkward, but I would like to delay this so that we could work with the developer to study better um, planning for this Certainly some of those buildings are tired, but tearing down all those commercial buildings that have some historic um, contribution to make to that area as one of the first downtowns, first suburban downtowns in Madison. And also not to say we should save them all, but just to look at that differently. I think that house on Russell Street is really in fine condition. And you know, why are we throwing away a really decent house that somebody would like to live in? Um, and, and ask them to scale back and look again at this project to do something more in keeping with the, the fabric. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Solheim. Well, Marsha just beat me to it. I was going to make a motion based on um, conditions nine and 12, um, but I also, I agree with her regarding, you know, wanting some time to look more at the historic nature of this neighborhood. Um, I, my main concerns, I actually, you know, I liked the exterior design of the building and I'm certainly supportive of additional housing and density, but I think that the way a building operates is just so critical um, to people in the building itself and the neighbors. and. The way that this um, is designed, I'm really not convinced it has the, the parking um, and also, you know, the kind of circulation needs to serve it. I think that it's really, um, I don't I don't support over parking, especially in a very pedestrian oriented neighborhood, but it is the developer's responsibility to kind of account for their own use of the property and, and provide that on a development. And I just don't see that happening here, at least uh, not yet. So I, I will uh, support the motion. Thank you. And I would accept adding at um, number 12 as an, uh, another finding. Commissioner Cantrell. Well, I'm going to be supporting the motion as well, but 
um, not for the reason that I think the, the one-story buildings along Winnebago should be preserved. I think that, that this is an appropriate redevelopment site, um, but I, I think that a three-story building would be more appropriate here. And I'm concerned about the, the parking and the access, uh, joint access, because I think that's, um, that looks like it could be a real problem um, for all three parties involved with, with that joint access area. So I, I would hope when they come back, they would have that addressed but I, I guess I would be looking more at a three-story building. Commissioner Sunquist. Yeah, I won't add a lot. I'll support the motion. And um, just in terms of guidance for the team and coming back, I personally am not too troubled by the number of parking stalls. Uh, I do agree that the, the shared driveway there and the the circulation is an issue. And maybe if it's a little, if the whole thing is scaled down a bit, um, there's room for fixing that. Um, but um, and I, and I guess in terms of preserving the buildings versus not, I'm somewhat. I could. I'm agnostic about that. I could, I like those buildings, but um, also this is a place as um, staff has pointed out that we've tried to direct redevelopment. So um, uh, I uh, personally be open to either one there. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Alder Heck. Thank you. Um, I would just echo what Commissioner Sunquist just said. I find value in those existing buildings, but I'm also open to creative solutions that address the concerns that have been that have been stated. So I'll be supporting the motion. Any other input? comments. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, and I will assume unanimous consent unless there is a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. And that is the last item on our agenda. I would be looking for a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Cantrell moved and Commissioner Hagenau seconded. I will assume unanimous consent unless there's a raised hand to object. Thank you all. And I will see you at the next meeting.